Oh, hello world. I'm your host, Adam Money Mike, and on this episode, we're going to talk about what makes a good fishing lure. My guest today is Jeremy Souls. Jeremy is an expert fisherman and lure maker. He answers the question of what makes a good fishing lure as he demonstrates building one. We cover all sorts of topics as it relates to lure making for salmon, walleye, steelhead, and all other freshwater fish. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction, you will be able to take what you've learned and apply it to your fishing skill set, and that's called value. And because of that, you should like this video. Remember that sharing is caring. Please leave comments because they improve ranking and add prominence. Subscribing is what winners do, but smashing the bell is what legends do. This channel catches legends. But first, AI news. AI and supercomputing were leveraged by researchers at Microsoft and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory to identify a new material with the potential to reduce the use of lithium in batteries up to 70%. It took the researchers less than a week using these technologies to narrow down 32 million potential inorganic material to 18 promising candidates. A task that would have taken over 20 years using standard methods. It took less than nine months from the discovery of the substance N2116, a solid state electrolyte, to develop a working battery prototype. And the mic is hot. Okay, we're good. Hello world. We got Jeremy. So Jeremy Souls. Souls. Yes. So Jeremy, tell the world about you. What you got here? Uh, so I'm big into fishing. Uh, I'm going to tie some flies today. Uh, these are flies most guys use here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they're using these as a trolling fly. So not your traditional cast type fly fishing. Um, they're tying them, uh, onto a rod and then trolling them behind the boat. And they're used a lot for uh, kokanee salmon. Um, I guess you could use them for steelhead, uh, trout, um, Used quite a bit out of Lake Roosevelt. These were all designed on Lake Roosevelt. Um, and I have a lot of guys that now like to use them as well and catch a lot of fish. So, Yeah, well, go ahead and tie it and tell me about wh what what made you use the color pink. Is there something about the kokanee? Do or, or they prefer pink? I know a lot of trout do and some salmon. Yeah, so... It's kind of weird. Uh, every day can be different. So some days, you know, these bright colors like a hot pink or a bright green or something like that could be uh, very enticing to the fish. And then uh, some days it could be just a plain old simple black. Uh, so there's there's really no rhyme or reason. It's just you throw one, whatever looks good to you as a fisherman on there, cast it out or put it behind the boat and uh, see what happens. And if, if you're not getting any action, then maybe uh, try, try a different color or a different bait and kind of go from there. Cool. So when talk about the trolling methods that you're using, are you using flashers? Is this going on the end of a flashing system? Yeah, it's a great question. So yeah, we use a dodger or a flasher. Um, I guess you can yep. call them either or. Yeah. Um, and you put that in front of your lure. Uh, so the fly in this case, and usually run a leader that's probably about anywhere from eight to 16 inches. And so by doing that, um, that imparts action to the actual fly. Uh, and so that action will make it dive up and down throughout the water column. And that what entices the fish to actually go out and grab that thing. Cool. So where do you get your tie flying products? Uh, so Silver Bow here in Spokane is a local fly shop. I use them quite a bit. Uh, I like to obviously always support local. Um, there was Swedes that was in the Garland district. Uh, he recently passed away. So rest in peace, Swede, um, where I used to get a lot of stuff from him as well. Uh, and then obviously online for stuff that I can't find locally. Um, I'll source different products, you know, on the internet and, uh, just kind of find what I like and, uh, try different materials, stuff like that. Uh, and I've even been known to, uh, pull some tinsel off the Christmas tree and throw that onto a fly as well. Yeah. That's part of the fun of it. Uh, I don't know if you've watched those videos where you where the guys go out in the woods, out, like some stream in the middle of nowhere, and they look at what the fish are biting on, and they just try to replicate that bug. Yeah. And they just tie it right there. I think that's really novel and cool. Yeah, that is that is and, very cool. And that's basically what you did. You're like, hey, we spend all this time trolling. 
Oh, so so I guess how did you figure out the fly system is what fishermen then they do fl uh, fish. Oh, that's um, true. You know, so that's these so true. These shiny shiny lures or these cool looking lures. Um, you know, people will put them in their tackle box and half the stuff in some guy's tackle box maybe not even work, and then uh, you know some of the other stuff does work better than others. Um, but I just started playing around from there. Uh, and kind of, like I said, developed these fishing on Lake Roosevelt. I fished there probably for the last 30 years since I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, started out with those original wooly buggers and just kind of evolved from there and figured, well, I know uh, we fish a lot of different baits um, and different lures that are these crazy colors and different color combos. And so I said, why not, you know, turn that into a fly and try that and see how that goes. And um, it, it's taken off and worked phenomenal. And like I said, I got a lot of guys that, message me and, and want to use these these flies as well because they just they've proven to catch a lot of fish so yeah so how did you figure out or how long has it took you to get to the point where you have down this specific fly type uh it it took me you know i, I started tying these flies a couple years ago and i'd say i tied a bunch of different variations a bunch of different styles um probably for about six months and then i really got this one dialed into to what i like and by me saying that it's the body style and in the 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 um the way that the, the fly works in the water and the action it gives. So just different materials I've learned that work better than others. And so by doing that, uh, it's kind of really give me my own style. And, and when guys see my flies now, they, they know, hey, that's Jeremy or that's a pack tack fly. So, Oh, good. So you've been able to brand yourself by the development of your own fly product. Yeah, definitely. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. So the length at the end that you're leaving, is that... Uh, any rhyme or reason yeah uh, a lot of a lot of fish uh will short strike and and as you notice i got two hooks on this fly yeah. um so when i say short strike they might just nip at the back of the, the the fly there and they'll get hooked by this this back hook um you know if they're really pounding them that day then you'll you'll have both those hooks in their mouth and we consider that buttoned up um but i try to keep it just rarely really just barely past that back hook mm -hmm. uh because we'll fish a lot of these with like either maggot or corn or some people like to put worms on them mm -hmm. i personally like to use a, a lot of uh, scented corns um so i'll get a white shoe peg corn put some scents on it uh and then just put one or two pieces of corn on each hook and then kind of roll with it from there that's cool corn what other things have you played around with for bait um i've used uh you know, power bait, which is a doe bait. Um, a lot of guys use that for shore fishing. So I've actually trolled that. That's kind of an unconventional um, way to, to use bait and troll. Uh, um, we've even caught not, not kokanee or salmon, but we've caught fish on hot dogs through the ice, uh, ice fishing. Dude, so. Some of the biggest bass I've ever caught in my life were on hot dogs. Yeah. It's, it's funny. We used to have a joke where we fished this tournament, uh, a few years ago, me and my buddy were doing a smallmouth bass fishing tournament. Um, and there were some guys fishing from shore, uh, and they were barbecuing hot dogs and we we're kind of fishing out from them and they they kept joking around hey you guys want to come to shore and get a hot dog and we're like oh we might get it for bait and the guy's like oh we actually caught a fish off a hot dog and we'd always joke about catching fish off hot dogs and never have and ever since then uh we made it a goal to catch fish off hot dogs and then we finally did and now it's kind of a little secret when we're ice fishing for pike that we we use hot dogs every now and then so Dude, it's true. It's yeah. like the cat food. It's like the, you know, like animals love dried cat food. Right. It's like the dried cat food for fish. Yeah. It, it, it Those those bass are so spoiled. So spoiled. I it's it, it's yeah. funny that you bring up cat food and, and unconventional baits because uh, I know some old timers that salmon fish um, and some of the different baits you pack with uh, tuna. And mm -hmm. so some guys actually buy canned cat food and pack it in there. And that's another little secret that, that guys do. And I've heard it's been very successful. I've never personally done it, but, um, you know, maybe one of these days. Huh. You know what? That, that is, yeah, because my dad, when we go fishing on the Columbia, uh, or, no, not Lake Wenatchee because you can't use bait. You can't use barbless hooks. You have to use barbless. But uh, yeah. On the Columbia, we got the plugs. Right. And you can put the tuna fish in it yep. and add whatever seasonings you want. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the super baits? Yeah, the yep. super baits. Yep. Yeah. The the ones that seem to be pretty popular, the Seahawks colored ones. Yep, Seahawk. And I actually, uh, so not only do I tie flies, I do other custom baits. And oh, so cool. uh, I actually do airbrushing of those those baits as well. So oh, I've sold, sold quite a bit of those. And well, those are good. Those yeah. Those are 
pretty popular and they're kind of hard to find in certain places yeah they they've become limited in the market and they're, they're a lot harder to find than they used to be and so, so if some of these custom colors they used to make quite a bit of them and guys can't get them anymore and so i do that occasionally um not a ton but i like to like to paint here and there too as well so mm-hmm. so do you got like a little airbrush that just like, yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, just a few different little airbrushes. I actually have uh, been airbrushing for probably 20 years or so. I used to airbrush, you know, just like uh, T-shirts, stuff like that, kind of just self-taught artist. Mm-hmm. Um, so doing that in the past and then decided uh, I, I, that airbrush actually sat in a box for probably 10 years and stopped using it. Um, had a bunch of old airbrush paints and then I bought a bunch of lure blanks and started painting those. And then um, being a salmon fisher myself and mm-hmm. using quite a bit of super baits, uh, I bought probably like a thousand super baits and then just started painting them slowly here and there and still got boxes of them. And um, with me, my artistic side comes in spurts and so it's here and there. And so when I get heavy into it, I'm, I'm all in and then, you know, I'll do that for a couple months and then kind of take a break and same with the flies. So, Oh, I feel you. Yeah, Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so where do you get your super bait, uh, blanks at uh well uh so brad's who makes super baits used to sell used to sell the blanks um and they no longer actually sell them so now you just have to buy either old old lures or uh or new lures and then just kind of either sand them down or some guys will chemically treat them to um actually get the old paint off of them uh but i i just do a little sand on mine paint them white and then just kind of go from there so Hmm. So have you, so you fish Roosevelt and you fish, uh, Lake Washington or is it like, uh, I'm no, uh, no, okay. No, I'm I've never actually fished Lake Washington. Yeah, I, you might be thinking of Lake I'm, Wenatchee as well. Yeah. I, I, so you have fished Lake Wenatchee? Uh, that one I have not fished. Oh, okay. I've yeah, not fished. So. A lot of fun. Come with me sometime. We'll go up there. Yeah. I heard go they catch them on just bare red hooks damn near yeah (laughs) they're just so aggressive by the time by the time those those little sockeyes make it up there they're just so aggressive that they're just hitting on almost everything i fish so when it comes to uh sockeye and salmon it's either columbia river or we fish brewster a lot Mm. i'm not sure if you've ever fished brewster yeah Uh, we Mm -hmm. some people call it like the brewster 500 and there's like 500 boats there at one time Mm -hmm. i have a couple videos i think on that and uh it's 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 crazy it's what we call bumper boats yeah and you're just basically just trying not to run into people the whole time so it's not for the faint of heart some Mm -hmm. guys some guys like it and some don't want to do it at all so Mm -hmm. oh yeah that's for sure i feel you i i know what it's like playing bumper just hitting the right trolling speed trying to hit that same spot looking at the point on the shore to try to make sure that you're like lining up and not right yeah so do you guys use downrigger balls uh you you, we used to. You can. Um, so I, I kind of got away from the downriggers. To me, it was just a little bit more hassle. Mm-hmm. Um, now we got what we call uh, droppers. Okay. Um, it's just a, you put a slider on the on the on your main line, um, and then the clips on a, a lead ball onto that, and then so that'll just pull it down. And then you use a line counter on your rod. Um, kind of tells you how far down, and it's not an exact science, but once you kind of figure it out, you're like, okay, I got 100 feet out with this much weight. Now I'm 40 feet down in the water column. So as time progresses and you fish more, obviously you learn that sort of stuff. But there are uh, like cheat sheets that kind of give you the math on how to do it that you can look up online mm-hmm. um, and kind of figure out where you're at in the water column. Because that's a big thing, obviously, when you're salmon fishing. A lot of guys will fish only the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where most salmon are caught on the bottom of the river system. Uh, uh, but there's also a lot of salmon early in the day and especially with sockeye that aren't. And so when you learn, all right, the, these fish are at 10 feet, I'm fishing in 80 feet of water, the fish are biting at 10 feet. Mm-hmm. Now I need four ounces of lead on at 80 feet out on my line counter. And then I'm at approximately 10 feet. That's probably not the exact mass. So don't quote me on that, but kind of gives you an idea. So I like the dropper. Yeah. I, I like that. Same with uh, my dad's dad. He preferred the dropper. Uh, over the downrigger yep. because he liked to feel it. And, and that's the thing is there's probably a lot of hits that you're missing because you're not physically touching the pole. Yeah. Compared to when it's in the downrigger, you see something, you're like, hey, might have been something. Might have yeah. Been. It's not really definitive. You know? <laughs> but could, when you're holding been a weed. onto the pole and you feel that salmon striking, uh, like, or it's bumping or it's trying to, and then 
you're like, okay, something's going on. And then you get at the right point and when you hook them and you're like, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't have. And th- there's, there's fish that get away because you use a downrigger. Yeah. That's for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, especially if you were downrigger fishing for something like a kokanee, mm-hmm. um, a lot of those kokanee can be some of them small fish are eight inches long. And so uh, they, they can't even trigger that. And I've actually had a, had them fishing on downriggers where we've been trolling around mm-hmm. and God knows how long that, that, that kokanee has been on there that I'm just drowning that thing. Um, so yeah, we, we started out with downriggers probably, you know, 15 years ago when I started salmon fishing 10, 10, 15, 20 years ago and, uh, kind of got away from it. And downriggers was like what everybody used back then. And droppers kind of got popular and they're even more popular now. And you see a lot of guys just leave the downriggers at home, never even use them anymore. And, Mm -hmm. um, to me, it makes it a little bit more enjoyable. Um, I don't have to worry about the downrigger and the mess with that and just set it, forget it and drop it down. So, uh, Another thing is I walleye fish quite a bit. And so like you had mentioned, you know, having the, having that pole in your hand or feeling the bite. Um, I personally fish with rods and, and rod holders mm-hmm. or yeah, rod holders a lot. Uh, and so with doing that, um, you know, me now I know, okay, that's a bite or that's a weed or that's a rock. And again, it's just from experience, but I take a lot of new guys fishing. Uh, and when you're walleye fishing, you use bottom bouncers. Not sure mm-hmm. if you've walleye fish much at mm-hmm. all, but yeah. So bottom bouncers, they, they tick the bottom the whole time. Um, there's always action on your rod. So for a lot of guys, it's hard for them to tell the difference of, oh, that's a bite or that's the bottom or, or that's a weed or whatever the case may be. And whereas I fish and I'm like, oh, that, that one's getting bit go grab it go grab it and they're like "Ah, i don't know i don't know and i'm like yeah grab it so i grab it set the hook and there's a fish on and a lot of times so they start seeing that then they go to grab it and they're still not educated enough or 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 experienced enough to know the difference of the two um so that's where guys that aren't as experienced i will uh you know put the rod in their hand so they they have more action and, and are able to fill it until they get the hang of it so cool cool yeah so here i'll just Cool. play your uh your videos in the elk rack here okay from your fishing show so talk about have you fished banks lake banks lake i have fished banks lake um you only time if you want only a couple times though okay so um talk about lake roosevelt how long have you been fishing there uh lake roosevelt probably as long as i can remember one of the first probably places i fished was lake roosevelt we spent a lot of time camping on lake roosevelt um to me that's one of my happy places in the world uh, it's one of the most beautiful places that we have here in washington yeah. so you know if you're in this area and you've never been i highly recommend it mm-hmm. um it's a national forest national park mm-hmm. uh and so all the shoreline I shouldn't say all, most of the shoreline is accessible. Um, you're able to camp right on shoreline when, the, when there's enough shore there. Uh, mm-hmm. The water does fluctuate, goes up and down. So be very careful if you're um, camping or anything on shore to make sure that you know what the water is going to do, which you can check online to see what the water level, if it's going up, if it's staying the same or coming down. Uh, take it from my experience to tie up your boat. If you are shore fishing or shore camping, um, we shore camped one one summer and i didn't tie my boat up at night and left it it was just a little 12 foot boat pulled it all the way up on shore and thought it was fine uh by the time i woke up there was no boat there and the water was about half a foot from my tent which i was probably was about 15 feet from the water to start with so the water had came up 15 feet overnight um very rare that it's going to come up that much usually you're going to see like a foot a day Mm -hmm. um so it was very drastic it was uh i think because of a issue with the dam or something Mm -hmm. so they had to either let a bunch of water out or in real quick Mm -hmm. um, which can happen on a reservoir like that and so uh luckily we found my boat probably about five miles down river full of water and it was just barely floating still Um, was there a motor yeah Uh, little was it little was it submerged little five horse motor on it and it was uh it's a little john boat so only sat maybe eight 10 inches off the water to begin Mm -hmm. with but by the time we got it and it was full of water it was about two inches from the from the top so Dang. yeah it was it was it was uh lesson it was a lesson learned it. yeah lesson learned that is a lesson learned so uh that is and that's a good point though roosevelt and uh banks lake are mm-hmm. both reservoirs yep. that are the byproducts of the grand coulee dam in yep. the the uh columbia river basin 
system or whatever. I could be wrong about that, but I know that no, those you're, yeah, you're, you're yeah those those lakes were created due to the Grand Coulee Dam, yep. which is the largest dam in the United States that produces most power, and people don't realize that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's a it's it's a, it's a it's a cool cool thing to see itself just the dam and they have laser light shows uh there in the summertime those are pretty cool um so i've went and watched that before and it's like i said it's just roosevelt's just one of those magical places that you know a lot of people don't get to experience in their lifetime Mm -hmm. yeah that's for sure now fishing for walleye uh yeah that's the way to do it you just cast out and you just bump the bottom yeah and it is a lot of experience to try to to try to be able to tell is this a weed? Is this a rock? Or is that actually a hit? Right. You know, and sometimes you, your mind plays tricks. on you. Yeah. Person. And yeah, as you go and you, you progress in fishing and, and you do it more and then you learn and then you can tell. And so it's definitely, I, I think out of all the fishing that I do, that's the one that I see guys have the biggest learning curve on. Mm-hmm. Um, but once you get it down, it's like, it's a no brainer in my opinion. So, yeah. So, so talk about your YouTube channel uh, and your fishing show. When did you start that? Yeah, so I started that. I think my first video, gosh, I'd have to look, but I think it was probably about 13 years ago. Um, so uh, I always wanted to make outdoor content, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And just back then, um, you know, unless you had really nice cameras and, and really good computers with editing software, there just wasn't as much capability for a, for a DIY type guy back then. Yeah. Um, and so as, you know, stuff progressed and uh, apps come out and, you know, different, different programs that we could use, um, I really what got me into it was I bought my first smartphone. Um, so I bought my first smartphone back then. Uh, I had a, a, you know, one of the brand new iPhone threes or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I recorded everything on. And like I told you, I uh, edited all my video. I think back then I was using iMovie that comes with the iPhone. Yeah. Um, so it was included. So they're, they're just very basic. I had no uh, conception behind what I was doing. Uh, I just wanted to record and put something out there. Mm-hmm. And back then it was more so like, I just want to have something for me to be able to go back and look on as time progresses and then yeah. um, as you look at some of my early videos they're, they're, they're just very basic uh, there's not a lot of editing um, it's just a camera in place and uh, not me really giving any explanation or talking or giving really any value yeah. um, to of my content to my uh, subscribers mm-hmm. and so now as the last few years progressed I want to be a little bit more um, diligent on the the content that I do provide um, provide more value and then uh, that way I kind of build more of a um, subscription based off of that um, versus just me out there doing my thing um, I want to actually bring value to the people that spend their time and, and watch my videos because I know time's precious it's our biggest asset that we have and so anybody that does spend their time watching my videos obviously I, I really uh truly uh, appreciate them doing that and mm-hmm. so I feel like it's a little way to give back is to, to provide a little value in the channel well you've definitely done a good job of producing a pretty good narrative you know from how it how the day leads out yeah I think it's great I appreciate that yeah and like I said it didn't start out that way so um you know, just a little bit of feedback here and there I get from guys. And so it just kind of helps me progress uh, and, and build my channel a little bit better from here. And, you know, what guys like, what they don't like and what they do see value in. So cool. One thing I've noticed and I use them for my shorts and it's it tends to work is just uh, do the do the fight. Just film the fight. Yeah. Where they're just fighting the whole time. Right. And that that gets that primal feeling, especially if it's POV into the audience member because that that fish fights really primal you know, yeah and everybody feels that so and people watch it just to, just for the suspense of what's going to come up and then and uh, yeah it, it's so popular of a of a format just watching the fight of the fish that there's a lot of other pranksters that'll like oh i pulled up a rock or i pulled up <laughs> some bullshit that's not even a fish yeah but uh but yeah, that's something to add with your fly tying and yeah, for sure. No, I think uh, that's funny. You say like somebody catches a rock. I got I got a video on, I believe on there. There, it's my buddy thinks he's got a big one on, and he gets it to the boat, and he's kind of like looking over, laughing, doesn't realize it, but he's caught a stick, and there's a stick in the water, yeah. and we're all laughing at him, making fun of him. So it makes for a good time, you know, good com- camaraderie. 
Yeah, yeah, it is a good time. So when you go out, are you doing much of the fishing, or are you just uh, just uh, filming? Uh, you know, it, it really depends um, who I'm with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, ha- I have a couple couple friends that I fish with that are, you know, avid fishermen like myself. And so um, when they're on the boat and, and I know that they've caught in a ton of fish, then, you know, it's kind of every, everybody kind of takes a turn. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm fishing with somebody that hasn't fished a lot and doesn't get out much fishing, um, a lot of times I let them reel in almost every fish. So yeah. to me, it's not so much about uh, reeling in the fish or catching the fish as much as it is, is catching the content yes. or, or um, actually um, sharing that experience with somebody mm-hmm. and, and building those relationships yes. um, through the outdoors and fishing. So Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's been 20 minutes, so I'm going to turn off the camera. Cool. Thanks for watching. Um, so, yeah, my, my nephew, when I was out, salmon fishing with them last time over the summer at Lake Mead. So, um, talk about your boat situation. Yeah. Uh, so I have a 18 and a half foot Hughes craft currently. Um, sportsman. It's a pretty solid aluminum boat, um, for pretty much everything that we do around in this area. Uh, and it, it's really handles really well on the river handles really mm-hmm. well on the lakes um unfortunately i've been having some motor issues on and off for the last couple of years where yeah. uh i had to have my motor rebuilt and that's still so having so. issues with it and so i don't use it as much as i would like right now but that's just a temporary time being and so um once i get that all dialed in then it'll, i'll be out there more on the lakes and you'll see me out more yeah have you done any ocean fishing yeah, I have. Uh, I, I never knew that I was uh, had seasickness until I decided to go oh, on the yeah. ocean. Um, I got on the ocean uh, for the first time probably, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so. Uh, we went out to Westport, mm-hmm. um, did the salmon and the, and the bottom fishing and all that. Uh, and I guess the captain said it was the worst that he's seen in the last. He's captain for 30 years, yeah. the worst he's seen in. 30 years the first day we get out we couldn't get over the jetty uh, oh yeah that's rough waves on each side of us where yeah. you couldn't couldn't see anything but water anymore um boat going straight up and down and so uh i started to feel it that day just not even barely making it out and so we had to turn around he, he called it we turned around we go back in and uh you know i did all the dramamine all that stuff and um next day comes and still pretty bad and so we're out there and he's like i think i can get us over you, you boys want to go and we're like yeah so we we, we make it out there and it's just it's miserable conditions and still we decided to fish and so that's when uh, everybody kind of looks at me and is like oh you're green Mm -hmm. you're you're going for it and so they're like looks like you're the chum bucket today and so uh you know i had paid my money and i loved to fish and so Mm -hmm. i got out there and i reeled in a fish puked reeled in a fish puked and i basically puked until i couldn't puke anymore but i caught all my limit and caught as many fish uh, more than some of the people that um, weren't getting sick and so uh you know, after probably the first 30 minutes of the deckhand making fun of me for puking all over the place, he stopped because I manned up and was out there and doing the thing and getting it done. And so he said, you know, I got to give you credit where credit's due. And I can't, can't sit here and make fun of you when you're at least doing it. Um, funny thing is I took a six pack of beer on that trip and thought I'd have a couple beers and, uh, everybody else was in the, in the cabin, um, and said, Hey, we ran out of beer. And I said, uh, grab my bag. There's a six pack on there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to drink them this week. And it was unfortunate because, uh, we, we fished probably three or four more days and the whole time we were there for about seven days. I was sick the whole time. And funny thing is now when I get on the boat, um, I can, I can definitely still feel it like any time that the weather's real rough or anything like that. Um, even on the lakes and rivers where prior to that never had an issue at all. So kind of a little thing. I don't know if it's more mental or anything, yeah, but PTSD and yeah, equilibrium. exactly. <laughs> it was not fun. So yeah. A uh, trick I learned that helped when I was, um, on ship. Cause I, in the Marines, I spent a year of my life on ship. On, okay. Just floating at sea. And, uh, Take mentholatum and just put it in your belly button. <laughs> it works. Really? Yeah. Do it before you get on the boat. I've never heard that. Yeah. It totally works. Um, I, I've had, well, this last time out, I threw up. 
Yeah, it, just leaving that jetty. It, it was really rough at, yeah. at, at Westport. It, it, last time I went out, it was for a link cod. Okay. And we went out in the summer, and we were taking off. I initially threw up, but once I get the first one done, then I'm good. But some people, they throw up once, and they're done. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I think the uh, the mentholatum helps me out. So that's something to think about. And next time you go out on the river, just put mentholatum in the belly button. See yeah. See how that works. Uh, it's, it's never been to the point on the river or the lakes where I get sick. I, I, I can feel it, but I won't get to that point where I can get sick. And I think that's more so knowing like the shore is just right there um, versus when you're out miles in the ocean and you're like, oh, yeah, there's no shore forever. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like another mental thing. And then uh, – now I, uh, if I know I'm going out on the sea or the ocean, I'll uh, get the the patches that you can put behind the ear, oh, yeah. and those seem to work for me. We we went out to, uh, or we went down to Florida it was a few years ago, um, and I rented a boat. We we're in the Florida Keys, and I rented a boat for the day, so I put the patch on, and it was one of the roughest days down there too. And we, uh, I, I was fine. I had no no issues at all there. So yeah, so. That's pretty exotic. So Florida Keys, what other places have you been to to go fishing? Um, I mean, that's that's probably the most exotic. Other than that, it's just kind of over on the coast here in uh, mm-hmm. Washington, um, Oregon coast surf fish and stuff like that. I haven't, haven't really done anything too crazy yet. I would like to more. Um, when I was down there in Florida, uh, I was with family, and uh, none of the family really cares to fish. And so – um, I just took a couple of my fishing poles. I took a bass fishing pole and then a big catfish fishing pole I have. Carried those on the plane with me right in my hand. Um, took a box of tackle, a lot of the tackle I made, uh, mm-hmm. and then went down there. And I just started casting offshore different places I could find. And, um, you know, if the family was um, – sitting at the beach or something like that. I took a fishing pole and stood in the water and caught a bunch of fish, but I mm-hmm. caught probably nothing gigantic, but I caught probably like eight or 10 different species. I caught a little barracuda, um, a oh, bunch cool. of different fish. I don't know what the names of them are. So that, that was really fun. So it was a little exotic and a little fun, something different. And, uh, I caught, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know if they call it a scorpion fish or something like that. It's one of those like spiny fish that if it mm-hmm. pokes you, it, it could possibly be deadly or venomous mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Um, we were down in, uh, where was it? Miami. I was down on South mm. Pier, Miami, uh, and casting off that. And I caught that right off the pier and had to lift it up about 20, 30 feet to get it. And, um, didn't know any better. So I just grabbed it like a bass holding it in its mouth. And that's, that's a pretty cool one. That, that whole trip's on, on my channel. So that, that's a cool one to watch in, in Florida. Yeah. In Florida. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. So what big trips do you got planned coming up? Um, I don't really have any fishing trips, unfortunately, planned on coming up. Uh, just anywhere I go where there's water, though, I try to take a fishing pole and fish now. So um, something that no water scares me, So except for the ones, I guess uh, I shouldn't say that because when I was in Miami, I did get a little scared of going fishing a canal because there was some gators in there. So oh, I, yeah, that would scare me. I decided not to do yeah. that, and my wife wanted me to come home. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So, um, have you done tuna? I have not done tuna, um, partially, and I've got invited to do it and I've turned it down every time because, uh, partially you have to go out usually for a whole day just to get to them. Um, and then yeah. once you're there, uh, you know, you fish and you're in the middle of nowhere in the ocean, how many miles from shore and then. With my experience of being that far out and the weather conditions and stuff like that, I just don't know if that's the trip I want to take or not yet. So maybe one day. Yeah, you're right. You do have to go farther out. Yeah, we, especially at Westport. When I was there, I was lucky. We only had to go 20, 20 miles. 20 miles. I mean, they're usually going 40. So. Right, yeah. I, I, the guys that we fished with, or at least the guy I fished with out of Westport, I know they go out the night before. You sleep in the boat, and mm-hmm. then you wake up. When you wake up, you're at the, the fishing grounds, and then you fish all day, and they go back, and you usually sleep on the way back and get home either, you know, really late at night or very, very, very early in the morning. So, Yeah, those are, those are fun trips. Um, when I was stationed in Camp Pendleton in the Marines, I had – I was spoiled because I had the ocean. Mm-hmm. And I lived in Oceanside, so I could go. I had so many towns in fishing charters to choose from. 
But uh, one of the favorite ones I did before they made it so you had to have a passport was I we used to go to San Diego and they'd go into Mexican water so you'd pay for a Mexican license. Okay. And you'd fish. And the Mexican fishing is way better than up in Southern California. There's just something about the fish and the tuna, everything, the barracuda, the dorado. Uh, they don't like that. They're more like elitist in yeah. Cal- once they hit California waters. <laughs> but down in Mexico, you know, they're they hit whatever. It's just way better fishing. Yeah, hands down. That's a lot of fun. I got into that's when I first got into uh, free diving for lobster. Okay. Yeah. So I was a. Uh, it's a fun thing to do. You should try spear fishing someday. Yeah. It, it, at Westport, it's a safe jetty. If you stay on the inside of the jetty and you just there's some big freaking lingcod on that jetty oh, yeah. that people don't realize. Yeah. Big freaking lingcod. But uh, yeah, it it's a lot of fun. Spear fishing is a unique thing because it's like. It, you're f- hunting, but you're fishing. Right. You're part of the system there. Them, them lean cod are, they're gnarly. They got some nasty teeth on them. I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to turn dark alley and see one of those things face to face. Yeah. Yeah. They're so ugly. Yeah. But they taste amazing. Yeah, they are. They, they are great really eating. taste good. Yeah, we man. were lucky enough to, when I did go to Westport and catch some of those some really nice ones so that, mm-hmm. that was fun and those are great eating i i i prefer eating the lean cod and the rock bass stuff like that over the salmon personally i like the oh the, yeah the white was, fish yeah oh yeah i prefer to anything ocean caught uh, i don't like to eat um inland fish yeah i just catch and release them yep and and that's something to think about like when i went out fishing for uh walleye in banks lake a few years ago and we caught a bunch of walleye and we're filleting them out and i'm thinking man there's a well there is way more uh mercury and all those heavy metals that uh land fish have yeah because of the boats Mm -hmm. and running all the motor oil and whatnot and that's something I think about, like what I would think that people would try to get electric motors for boats before they would cars for yeah. electric vehicles. Because you, you're out in the boat and you see the 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 film of oil that goes out from the gas and mm-hmm. whatnot. And you think, well, we're blowing this shit right into their ecosystem. They're stuck in this lake. And it all goes down to the bottom. The turtles have the most saturation of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's gotten maybe a little better. The, uh, the four, I don't know. And this might be a blanket statement, but the four strokes versus the old two strokes, the old two strokes, like uh, that used to be just commonplace, you know, our granddads and stuff, all the, all those boats had those. And so those things are just leaking oil everywhere. It seemed like that, that mixture of gas. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, they are, I, I have seen some, uh, you know, newer, like main motor boats that they're doing with, uh, uh, electric motors. Um, so I think that is kind of a, a way that they're getting into, but it's, um, when you get those electric motors, it's that battery, right? So how, mm-hmm. how long is that battery going to last? And then how heavy it is, it, is it in your boat and how, how much space does it take up? Um, you know, a lot of us guys that troll, we do use electric motors to troll, but you got to use that gas motor to get back and forth. Um, like I had mentioned, I have issues with my main motor on my boat. My boat has three motors on it. So I got electric motor, bow mount, electric motor. Um, that's pretty much the motor that I use 90% of the time. Um, I do have a kicker motor, um, which is a little 9.9. So when you say kicker, it's a little accessory, smaller gas motor on the back of the boat, typically. Um, and then your main motor, my main motor is a 115 Honda. Um, and so that 115 is what gets you going, you know, average about 36 miles an hour on my boat. Um, and so when you're fishing something like uh, Lake Roosevelt, Columbia River, something like that, um, you know, you're going up down river five, 10 miles at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, with that 115, it's not that bad that that trip doesn't take that long um but if you're only using that 10 horse 9.9 kicker on that you know it might take you all day to get from one side to the other um and so you don't you just don't have as much accessibility so the bigger the motor um more gas you burn the farther Mm -hmm. you can go the faster you can get there right um but once we're to the spot where we fish 
uh, it's usually that either that kicker motor or that electric motor. Um, and so that electric motor is nice because the, uh, the advancing technology that they have now, you can set courses, um, they troll themselves. Um, you know, there's buttons that you can push that'll keep you in one direction. Um, it'll fight the wind yeah. for you. Uh, you even have an anchor system on, uh, anchor system on the, on the bow mount that I have now um, mm-hmm. called Spot Lock. So I push a button and it's GPS to that location. And um, whether there's current, wind or anything like that, um, it'll hold you right there. Uh, and that, that's really been a game changer. Once I got that, I got that maybe four or five years ago. And so that really changed uh, the way I'm able to fish for different things. Um, being a, on a boat myself, usually if I'm running a boat by myself and I got three or four other guys on there, um, I consider myself the captain. So mm-hmm. their safety um, is imperative and I want to make sure that everybody stays safe. And so if we get in a situation where rods get tangled up mm-hmm. or you get stuck or something like that, you can push that button, you're stopped right there, get everything back to where you need to be versus just kind of a free drift or floating or you know, not really able to keep track of what you're doing. Um, and then I start, uh, started sturgeon fishing. And when we sturgeon fish, yeah. we're way up, way up in the Columbia or Lake Roosevelt mm-hmm. by Kettle Falls area, China, China Bend. Um, gets quite a bit of current up there. I've been up there in the, you know, early spring uh, or late spring. And there's been four or five miles an hour of current um, where we used to have to take an anchor. And so if you anchor up in 120 feet of water, um, you got this 45, 35 pound anchor, you drop that down. Um, and then when you got to pull it up, you know, a hundred something feet, um, they have what they consider the Columbia acre river system. Uh, so it helps pull it up. Um, but it's just, it's a lot of work to drop that anchor, um, move spots. And so once you drop it three or four times in the day and you're just beat from lifting that thing out of the water into the boat so much, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like this is the spot we're fishing for the rest of the day. I don't want to move. Uh, but I got that spot lock. I don't even bring my anchor on the boat anymore. I get to the spot I want to go hit, put that button on and just the boat stays there and I don't have to worry about it anymore. So it's a very, very cool feature to have. So, yeah, that's nice. What, what year did you say your boat was? Uh, my boat is a 2011. Oh, so pretty new. Yeah. So it's a newer. So that's why I was unfortunate, um, that I had the motor issue that I had, uh, you know, it's just one of those situations where, um, kind of a freak thing. Uh, what, what ended up happening is I had a, a ring break, mm. um, on one of the pistons. And then when that broke, it had to be taken apart, um, and changed. And that all happened, uh, right before COVID. So as we know, when COVID hit, you couldn't get anything anymore and everything kind of shut down. And so it yeah. took like probably almost 12 months just to get the parts. So I mm-hmm. sat there with no boat for 12 months. Then, uh, when it got put back together, it wasn't done right. And it just kept going back and forth. And so it's just kind of been a pain and, and a headache ever, ever since. And so, um, just one of these days I'll get it dialed in. I might actually repower at this point and stop throwing money into the motor that I have now, because you can only throw so much money at something before you consider yourself crazy. I think so. Yeah. Or you'd take the turn that my dad did, which is just learn small engine mechanics <laughs> yourself and do it yourself right? and just have to be that person to save yourself the money. Yeah. It's, yeah, it might be, that which might be has bad happened time. because like, I remember growing up, we lived in the West side of the state called, uh, this little area called Tootle. It's by, by Mount St. Helens. Okay. And there's this lake called Silver Lake. And we'd go duck hunting every weekend, literally almost every week, almost. And during the season, if it was a nice day, we'd and we'd go out. But it rains all the time down there. Okay. And so we just had the duck boat with the little 10 horse or seven horse Johnson or whatever the fuck it was. Yeah. And it was my responsibility to go down there and bail the damn boat out <laughs> every day because it's raining. Right. You know, most of the time. Uh, well, not every day, but every other day. And it depended on if it rained. But I like going down to the boathouse anyway because it was always, I could fish. But yeah, but yeah there was times where the motor would, it, it, the boat would flood. I remember like a couple times the the motor was totally submerged. Yeah. <laughs> and so my dad would have to go and take it all apart. Right. And redo it. Clean and, the carbs out. Yeah. So is your boat a aluminum or fiberglass? Yeah, it's an aluminum boat. Yeah, um, so we yeah, can do it. Yeah, so it seems like that's kind of the thing around here in the Pacific Northwest is if you're a fisherman, um, if you are in the river at all, then you're definitely getting an aluminum boat. You, you see a lot more fishermen in aluminum boats than anything, um, except for your bass guys and, and your walleye guys tend to still like the uh, 
fiberglass boats and that's because they're running faster longer um and so those fiberglass boats are when you're in in the water in the chop and stuff like that they're probably a little bit more comfortable i would say um Mm -hmm. but if you're in the river and possibly going to bang the bottom or anything like that then the the aluminum boat might be a little bit safer um mm-hmm. I've, I've been known to hit a rock here or there yeah how many the props bottom, have so. you broken off um uh, i'm on my third prop mm. uh, i broke the bottom half of my motor off oh, one of my shit. first times in the motor uh or in the river when i bought my boat um, which i'd capped in my friend's boat and a couple other boats um, many times and mm-hmm. then i got my boat and uh just wasn't as familiar with the place that i was in the river and one of my friends that was with me said that we were good to go this way when I should have went the other way. And so next thing I know I'm doing about 30 miles an hour and I hear this loud boom. And then my back motor is just jacked out of the sky and it was uh, both boat in the back ends getting all squirrely and it was a little crazy, but a uh, lesson learned again. So it's something I'll, I'll make sure that I'm a little bit more safe and cautious out there in that river. So yeah, the Columbia river can cost you a lot of props. Yeah. A lot of props. And then those, those little stumps, those pylons that are from some abandoned dock, if it gets yep. low enough. All right, and that depends, too, on the dam, the dams, yeah, the, the river dams, yep, how much the they're running. Water level. Uh, that's That was actually my first prop was on a, on a probably, it could have been a metal pole or a wood pole. So we were fishing on the Ponderé River. Mm-hmm. Um, used to be great pi- pike fishing on the Ponderé River, mm-hmm. and they netted it and fishing's not as good anymore um and so they we don't, netted it yeah they, so they, they opened it up for netting no it was uh so the the natives net net it because there's a pike are an invasive species and oh. so the pond array um flows eventually into the columbia and they don't want it uh the the pike to get into the columbia which they are in the columbia um yeah. they're in roosevelt we've caught them in roosevelt uh but they don't want them to continue to trickle down because of the salmon and stillhead and so they're the most invasive species um, that we have around here. And so they're going to eat more of the eggs and smolt and all that and kill all those fish. Um, and so they, they put bounties. Uh, Roosevelt has a bounty on pike, um, and they've been netting it as well. They net uh, Lake Spokane, also known as uh, Long Lake, um, had some really good pike in it. And so that, that gets net, no shit. nets in it I didn't too. I know I had pike. Yeah, uh, pike and walleye in, in Long Lake. So um, we've caught some really nice walleye in there and some nice pike. Um, but anyways, the, the river was flooded uh, one year, and so you get what they call slows, and basically it's just uh, the water into farmer's fields, and mm-hmm. so we're in this farmer's field fishing, <laughs> yeah. and I'm yep. just kind of trolling along, and next thing I know, kind of the same thing, where I hear, hear this loud boom, and I look back, and the motor kind of kicks up, and so we, we stop, check check the prop and I knock off one of the fins of the prop and you look at the fish finder and you know, just the smooth bottom and all of a sudden there's just a straight line up and down. And so that's indication of a fence post. And so what I had done is hit a fence post that I guess when you're fishing in a farmer's field, which sounds weird that happens. So, Mm -hmm. yep, that's part of it. That's, it reminds me of evergreen reservoir. It's down by Quincy ish. I don't know. It's down there. But uh, it, it's a fun time. But it, yeah, it, the, have you, so on, on the, the world of salmon, okay? So as a data scientist, I mined enough data on the salmon mm-hmm. because one of those arguments, and it's a bullshit fucking argument, to take out our hydroelectric power dams is because the salmon are dying and here's the thing i found out as i have and so i made this a point i'm like i don't think i'm like maybe that's the case maybe that's not let's look it up so i compiled as much data sets as i could on salmon counts and the one thing that i found when i mined through all the salmon data whether it's up in alaska or whether it's down in washington the only thing it proves is how they sample the salmon and the one thing that also if people just realize it the wild salmon populations are decreasing because we have a shit ton of factory salmon and hatcheries yeah we're just flooding it with hatchery salmon which totally skews the population and everybody's just looking and they they look at the wild salmon they're looking for that little fin in the back right and but 
the reality is it the fact is taking out our dams and threatening to take out our hydroelectric dams and the snake river dams i think is a total bullshit proposition by people who don't understand the the current situation yeah and, and that's one thing i find with a lot of these these uh people on the west side of the state who think that they can enact policy based off their feelings but the fact is the real biologists are the ones out there fishing in seeing the salmon how they work and you brought up the pike being invasive and i think man maybe they should let in more pike yeah. just to take <laughs> out the squawfish i think that's probably why they were originally put there um was that kind of that theory um, and you know, a, a lot of things have changed since the seventies. Right. And so that's, that's what you think of. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of this take out this stuff happened. And that's why we got, like I said, now there's, there's a, a walleye in, in Long Lake, uh, Lake Spokane is because, um, guys took them from Roosevelt and started putting them in there and they what they consider a bucket biologist, um, make their own fishery. And so that kind of changes everything else that's done. Um, and, the, and the true biologists and what the world do, um, it skews that and because they realize that they're going to run away until X amount of years go by. And um, the pike uh, came down, I think it was uh, the Clark Fork, um, get into uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene Lake. Uh, so there's a bunch in Coeur d'Alene Lake, which they, they net that as well. So hmm. pretty much anywhere that there's pike in, they're, they're putting nets in these days. Um, and that's, you know, some guys think that's great. Some guys think that's that's a problem. I see both sides of the story, um, so I get it. Uh, but those those pike are now in Long Lake uh, and mm -hmm. have been in there forever because um, I think actually the state record for pike is out of Long Lake, uh, and those fish just make it down the river system, right? So uh, Clark Fork, Coeur d'Alene, Spokane River, which is Long Lake, mm -hmm. um, essentially all the way down to Roosevelt. Um, and, and when, when you say, you know, taking down the dams, and again, um, I've done a lot of research on that myself, and I see both sides of the story. Um, there, I think there's ways uh, that they maintain the dams and then still can help the fish population as well too, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've seen some dams come down, the Elwha Dam, uh, they took that down. Um, the sediment was so crazy behind that. It, 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 I think it took a couple years, um, for the salmon and still had to actually start running back there. But now there's some record runs back there. Um, when I say record runs, what's a record? A record is only how long they've kept track, right? Mm -hmm. You know that? Um, so they haven't kept track that long too, right? So there are odds, there's automatically going to be a record run. Mm -hmm. Um, but they are seeing more fish return to some of those places. And I think that's just management of the actual, uh, habitation for the fish. Um, so the places we do have, uh, we need to maintain that hab habitat and not destroy them and, and let people overfish them, um, mm -hmm. and overpopulate them, stuff like that. And so that, I think that's more so where we're seeing the decline in salmon mm -hmm. is there's just more people, right? And so more habitat is taken away each and every year. Um, and, and also we don't have fish ladders on some of these dams. And so some of these dams, um, the fish can't get to Spokane, uh, river downtown, the reason that we have the city of Spokane um, is because that was one of the native, uh, biggest native uh, salmon fishing areas there was in the world. Um, I can't remember if it was four or five, maybe even more tribes, um, all gathered down into, I think, what they call Police Flats now or Peaceful Valley. Um, and that used to be just all these different tribes used to come down there and basically set up their their camp or city or whatever you want to call it um, and come down there and fish. And so they have what they call, you could look it up, June hogs, um, where these were some of the biggest salmon in the world. They're all Columbia River salmon, but the tributaries that they spawned in were the Spokane River. None of those fish can get here anymore. And that, that gene is almost decimated, if not decimated. Interesting. And so that's why we see, you know, a bigger decline as well is because mm. uh, genetics. Um, and like you said, they try to take these genetics and then pump them into hatcheries. And it's mm -hmm. not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've even done a fishing tournament that's called uh, King of the Reach mm -hmm. um, out of the White Bluffs, um, Vernita area on the Columbia River. Yeah, I know uh, Vernita, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a genetic. It's a really uh, nice. You can catch a lot of my uncle caught a lot of jacks there yeah. with, the, with the wiggle worm. Yeah, it, and that that tournament per se, like when they first started that, the fishing because it's like a week or two after the actual salmon season closes, so it's like the most prime 
time uh, when these when these fish are up there spawning. And so you used to be able to go up there. I think one day we caught like 20 fish um, in a day, and that now it's like there's still guys that do it, but mm-hmm. it's not. It's fewer and far between. And the and some guys are saying that that catch and capture derby is actually ruining salmon fishing. Mm-hmm. Some guys believe it's the only thing still keeping salmon together. So you're always going to have two sides of the story. Um, you know, a lot of guys aren't going to agree on certain topics. So uh, I think trying to be open-minded and kind of looking at both sides and what, what can we actually do to make it better versus just complaining about what we're doing now? Cause um, obviously we know we need to do things to make everything better or we're going to start losing resources. Right. So. Yeah. And you brought up, two points that just are going to forever change the, like brought things together for me. And that was the term, the bucket biologist, like no shit. I didn't (laughs) think of that. And I think of all the, a lot of situations where bucket biologists have messed shit up. Like for example, the red rock crab all over on our coast. Those are an invasive species. You can keep as many red rock, any, any sex you want uh, because well, they taste great, first yeah. off. Uh, I mean, I don't blame them for... I'm sure it was... It, it's an Asian crab, so okay. somebody brought it here to try to cultivate their own, and they just took over. I don't know how bad the red rock crab compete with the Dungeness. I don't know, but um, I know they taste good, and that's one aspect of it. I also think, because my kids live in Oregon, so I got three kids, and they, they live down in Oregon and when I go to visit on my drive they live in Walport so I'm driving over the over the bridges going from Newport and like driving over the the bays okay and so they used to have record salmon fishing just or whatever that means yeah amazing salmon a lot better salmon fishing from the ocean all the way in in the tributaries and the salmon tasted good too because they were basically in the brackish water and they hadn't gone full muddy taste you know right. they're to taste ocean they used to have great runs and then the seals started getting hunted one day many years ago the seals were getting hunted by the orca mm-hmm. and the seals got up onto the 101 highway and they shut down traffic and they shut down traffic and then they had to go out and they send the Coast Guard out. And the Coast Guard to this day in Lincoln County goes out to scare away the orca as the orca come in to go and eat the seals. And one of the reasons why they shut it down is when people were driving over the bays and harbors, it was just covered in blood. Really? It looked like D-Day because the freaking <laughs> orca were just murdering these seals, Crazy. eating them. And the orca... it in. And like when, when I ran on, like I ran on the beach, um, there not that long ago, I f- saw a dead seal and they eat the heads. They just bite the heads off. Kind of like a cat will just munch on the, munch on the skull of a mouse. Huh. It's the same thing. So they bite the heads off of the orca. Or I'm sorry, the orca bite their heads off. But anyway, they kill these seals. There's this pod of orca that comes and they, they take care of the seal population. But now these seals are protected by the coast guard. Which goes out to intervene when the orca come out. And that's the only, their job is, that's one of their jobs, scare off the orca. And then the seals are just devastating the salmon. Yeah. Because the salmon got to come in through there, through that harbor and into the tributaries. So that's just one of the, the consequences too of people overreacting. Yeah, yeah, it's bad, bad management per se, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not a biologist, so who am mm-hmm. I to say? But that, and that's another argument, right? There's there's those guys that say, well, it's the seals, or there's guys that say it's the the nets in the river system um, because they do a lot of uh, uh, salmon netting mm-hmm. in the river system, which um, you know the natives have the right to do that, and so mm-hmm. they complain about that. But it is what it is, right? And so I think it's. Uh, like you said, just figuring out different ways to adapt to what, what we are doing, um, because what we are doing is obviously not working so great. And so they, they need to, you know, think of different things to try, I guess, per se. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And there's and then it's interesting because those the seal eating orcas come and the seal eating orcas are the ones that are supposed to eat the seals. But when they leave the harbor full of blood, it reduces the tourism. Right. <laughs> so uh, and. And then there's certain orcas that only eat the coho. Okay. 
or I'm sorry, the Chinook, the okay. Chinook salmon, the big ones, because they can sense their big bladder or huh. their air bladder. Or I, I was not aware of that. Yeah, there's a there's a certain pods of orca that only eat the co or Chinook. They don't eat anything else. They don't eat the seals. And then there's certain pods of orca that only eat the seals. And it it it's a, it's a unique cycle. Yeah. And also, so have you heard of the Fish Pro? It's really cool. I don't think I have. It's like a two hundred dollar lure if you mess it up, but <laughs> but uh, it's something you I want to get. But it's like GoPro, but you put it down, and you can cast it out, and you can okay. have it follow behind, or in front of your lure. I I I I actually own this. Um, oh, you do? Cool. Yes, it's uh, it's a different name. I can't think right. of it. Uh, Go Fish, I think. Go Fish. Yeah, yeah. Go, Go Fish. Fish. Oh, yes. I was thinking yes. Fish Pro. I own Let's this. Go Fish. Yes, it's a yeah, a little like submarine style camera. Yeah, talk about yeah. that. Uh, so I I I decided to purchase. So I I do a lot of my filming with GoPros. Um, and my phone, um, pretty basic, uh, you know, nothing too fancy, um, in, anything anybody could use. Uh, but I decided, you know, am I going to buy another GoPro this year? Or am I going to buy this camera? Cause it looks really cool. And I think this underwater footage would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I decided to buy the go fish, uh, and you know, it's cool. I've only used it a little bit for trolling. Um, mm -hmm. and so unless the water's really clear, um, you know, it doesn't pick up a lot until that fish actually comes in, but it is cool to be able to troll that bait. You see it kind of swimming along and then all of a sudden you just see this shadow kind of creep up on you. And then all, all of a sudden, bam, it, it slams your lure and, and you see it. The, the bad part is, is once it actually grabs that lure, the, the footage is so crazy, um, and shaking around, it, it's kind of gives you motion sickness just to watch it. Uh -huh. Um, so I, I, I then after using it for trolling, I did decide to use it for um, casting uh, for steelhead under a mm -hmm. bobber. Um, and that's really cool. And I do have a video on my channel where we are uh, steelhead fishing um, out of a drift boat. And unfortunately, I didn't catch any fish with that on there. But I did um, go back and watch the footage. And it's amazing to see how many fish are around your lure all the time that you would never know are there um, that just don't bite your lure or don't pay any attention to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I did have a few fish that came up um, and kind of looked at my jig because when you're bobber fishing for steelhead, you're mostly using jigs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had some that kind of swam by and looked, some that had just floated right over the top. I had one that come up and looked at it uh, and actually had another orange jig in its mouth still that had broken somebody off. Uh, so, so it is a very cool camera. Um, it's very fun to go back and watch that footage. Um, I think it's just, uh, I need to learn how to use it a little bit better and, and be more tactical on, um, managing that video and being able to put that into production, mm -hmm. um, to actually make it watchable. Uh, cause like I said, once, once the fish grabs it, I think it's cooler to see the fish down there until mm -hmm. it grabs it. Because once it grabs it, um, that video is just like so shaky and so crazy. You're just like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to watch that. Why would, I, why would anybody else? So, so um, you're, you're watching the video after the fact. Yeah. You can't, okay. you can't watch it live. So mm -hmm. that's one of the downfalls. Um, and it only records for. 30 minutes, I think, is the battery life if you're lucky. Um, a lot of the cold weather will kill it even faster. Mm. So, so expect about 20 yeah. minutes on it before okay. you got to recharge it. And then you got to charge it a couple hours to get another 20 minutes out of it. This is um, valuable. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for letting me know this. Yeah. It, and it's, don't get me wrong, it's still cool. It's not as cool as like I thought it was going to be, but um, it's been valuable because that day I did go out uh, still heading. Um, you know, I was able to, to cast and I saw that fish with an orange jig in its mouth uh, come up and look at my lure. And at the time, I think in a video, I might have been using a pink or a white lure. Um, but you know what I did is I changed to orange and we started catching fish on orange. So um, I was able to run that, lure, uh, that camera out there for 30 minutes, come back on, stop fishing, watch some of the footage um, and scrub it through my phone and be able to go back. Oh, there are fish here. Uh, let's keep fishing it. Like there's no sense in moving. We just need to figure out now how to get these fish to bite. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's another big thing I'm a believer in is, you know, you hear guys all the time say, Oh, they just weren't biting today. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the fish are always biting. It's just, you got to find the fish that are biting. Um, so you can be, and what I mean by that is you can be out fishing uh, and I use it for walleye fishing for a good example. I go out down there and I'll mark fish on my, my fish finder. And I know there's fish there, but I can't get them to bite. So I'll run through every different lure, every different bait, um, every different color combo I can think of. And if I can't get those fish to bite, well, now it's time to move and go find fish that are biting. Um, something about the water and that system and that time and that, uh, 
speed of, of current or whatever the case may be um, just in that river at that moment. Um, and it could be somewhere I caught fish the day before. They just aren't biting at that spot. Mm -hmm. But I'll go somewhere else and then we'll just start nailing them. Just wham, wham, wham. And I'm um, using the same exact stuff. It's just because we found fish that are more aggressively feeding in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fish that we found in the first section, uh, there could have just been no bait down there. And so they're just not there to eat. They're just mm -hmm. down there to uh, chill. Like I said, it could be the, the, the water down there is a little bit more calm. So it's easier for them to maintain um, and just hang out there mm -hmm. versus now they need to go out and they're going to go find their restaurant and go find some food and eat. Um, and so I got to go find out where that restaurant is and then throw my bait down there and start catching them. So, yeah, I wish more marketers would start fishing because <laughs> I mean, exactly what you said is like, uh, goes back to a lot of marketing. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I think about it even it, and what's fun about filming the fishing and then putting it on YouTube is you're fishing again for the audience yep. to try to see what are they biting on? Do they like this trending? Uh, do they like this song or whatnot uh, with this video? Um, so that, that's always fun too. Yeah, for sure. So have you considered underwater drones? Uh, that would be awesome. I, I don't know. I, I don't even know any good products for that. So, um, that would be very cool to be able to go out there and see. I know we, uh, there are like underwater cameras as well for ice fishing, where mm -hmm. if you're fishing a hole that you drop that camera down there and you can see that live. Um, mm -hmm. so I've, I've thought about, I've just got an ice fishing a couple of years ago. So I thought of doing something like that, but an underwater drone would be, would be amazing to be able to go down there and, and see what's really going on underwater. Right. So dude, and it brings the production quality up way better because I'm, I'm listening. Cause I think about this wholesale, uh, so I'm watching all these other like video marketers and they all got the flying drones right. and flying drones have regulations. The underwater drones. Well, one, they're more expensive. Right. So you're <laughs> looking in, if you want a good one, you need to start at 1700. Okay. And then up to three grand. Yeah. Um, but it depends. The three grand one's got the claw. Oh, okay. If you want the claw that, and it, and there's tethered ones. There's non-tethered ones. Yeah, I, was gonna I say, would definitely I, do a tethered I one. I think they have to be tethered to get live feed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, without without tether, I don't think you can live feed between the water and the airspace. So. Yeah, but I think it'd be something that'd be cool to pick yeah. up the production quality. It's 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 a goal for me one day is to get one of those underwater drones. Yeah, let me know when you do. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll go well, try it out. Yeah. Um, I use that. That's like a, you'll see, I do have some underwater shots on my video, stuff like that. And you'll see, and it's just, that's just me with the a GoPro on a selfie stick, yeah. dipping it down in the water. Mm -hmm. um, and so same, same kind of deal like that. When, when I can watch my GoPro from my phone in the open air, but as soon as I stick it in the water, I no longer have feeds. So mm -hmm. I can't, can't really see what's going on down there until I actually pull it back out of the water and go watch the video. So um, that's always been something that it would be nice to see live what's going on down there real time and kind of you know be able to increase your skill level off that i think and just being able to see what's going on so i know watching some of those like i said ice fishing mm -hmm. videos where they got those cameras down there the guys you see them jigging yeah and there's a fish that comes up and they're like oh i gotta stop or i need to jig more or whatever the case may be and watch watch that fish actually take it i think is very cool and brings a lot of production value to the video so yeah, where do you go ice fishing at around here? Uh, so ice fishing, I started out um, actually over on, no, what was it, not Newman Lake. Uh, we were fishing Hayden Lake. So Hayden Lake's pretty fairly large lake over in Idaho, pretty mm -hmm. close to us. Um, and that lake doesn't freeze over the whole way. There's a shallow bay on one part of the lake. So we'd go over there and fish. And I knew some buddies over there, and I'd never really ice fished before. So they had me go over there. Um, and it was, you know, it was pretty slow, but it was more camaraderie. You get 10 guys out there on the ice. We pull our sleds out, throw a barbecue on there, and just kind of hang out on the ice all day. Um, so it's fun. And then uh, some other buddies are like, yeah, let's go chase some other fish and do some other stuff. So then we started uh, fishing some of the local lakes here in Spokane County. Um, and so uh, last year we fished Diamond Lake. There was a tournament out there that we fished um, for trout and perch. That was very fun to fish. Um, but Aloika Lake, I fished that. Uh, and just a few other little, little lakes around here, but I just started doing that. And I've only done it a few times every year. Um, this year, the ice is just now getting thick enough and, you know, it's already mid January. Whereas in last year, I think it was, you know, 
November that we were ice fishing. Um, mm-hmm. So every year is a little different and you want to make sure you practice safety. You don't want to get out there on thin ice. And yeah. that's something that's kept me yeah. off the ice for all these years until I got friends that are very uh, sufficient in it and have mm-hmm. done it for a long time um, is the safety aspect of it. And so unless I know there's very safe ice, I don't even want to be out there walking yeah. on it. And uh, you know, there's a lot of days where we'll go out um, before the sun even comes up in the morning where you go out and watch the sunrise on the ice. And so, uh, you know, if you're not familiar um, and know what you're doing, that can be kind of scary. And it's just uh, getting out on that ice and you hear that cracking and the moving and all that stuff. It, it just kind of gets in your head at times when you're out there in the dark and until you actually learn what you're doing. So um, being with, uh, people that are knowledgeable and and know the safety and, and how to do it has been uh, kind of a game changer for me and why I've done it a little bit more in these past few years and why I want to continue to do it it's just kind of learning as I go so yeah so, and I'm thinking about how would I do it I'd probably if I had to do it all by myself like here's an auger right an <laughs> auger and a, uh, I'd probably be close to the shore yeah <laughs> but if yeah, if yeah, I had some friend who's like, no, I know the ice. Oh, this is good. And, and I, you know, I can see that he didn't fall through. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, and he could set up his shack. I don't know. Do you guys, do you do the shacks? Uh, I personally don't have one yet, uh, but all my yeah. bu- all my buddies do. Um, my friend Eric, he has a really cool one. Uh, it's made by Clam Outdoors, so it's a, so it's a sled. Um, Mm -hmm. and then the shack's built into the sled and it has a nice comfy seat on it. It has lights in it and it's cool because he pulls the sled out there with all his gear, um, and just sets, sets up and drills his hole and starts fishing. And then if it gets too cold, uh, the sled just like a pop over. So it's just like a grab, grab a handle and it just folds right over you, um, Mm -hmm. versus having to set together like a pop-up type 10 or something like that. Um, so it's really cool. I'd, I'd love to have one of those. It's just, I don't probably don't ice fish enough yet to justify the cost of it, but maybe someday I'll have that. So, yeah. So what, what are you guys using when you're out ice fishing? Uh, again, I tie, I tie, um, you know, little ice jigs that I started tying. I use a lot of those, um, a lot of tungsten cause it drops faster. Uh, but then you just tip, tip it with a little maggot or a little piece of, uh, corn or, or, or shrimp or um, worm and then uh, some guys will jig and it really depends on what you're ice fishing for too a lot of the ice fishing is for the smaller fish um, now if we're uh, if we're over pike fishing um, you know then we might use hot dogs mm-hmm. uh, and so it's it's just crazy the variety of baits and different things you can use um, and tactics uh, and there are little artificial lures too besides just jigs that you can use like a little rattle traps or um, little plastics and stuff like that that you can tie on um usually most lakes you can uh, get a two pole permit in washington Mm -hmm. um and so when that's when you're able to do that usually i'll fish one pole by hand usually jigging something like that and then i'll put bait on another one out of a rod holder or something like that and um if that goes off and that that fishing's hot for the day and they're taking more bait then we'll fish bait or you know that's not really picking off then we'll uh, fish more jigs and so it just depends on you know what the fish are doing that day and if they're biting or they're not biting um, but like I said it's it's always usually a good time and pulling that sled out there with that barbecue is one of the benefits yeah. I always I always like to have the barbecue with me as much as possible yeah, when I fish sure. and have a little warm food out there so that sounds like a lot of fun it is it is you'll have to go with us sometime oh for sure yeah yeah so are you guys catching I guess whatever will hit. So yeah. like perch or yeah, a lot, of, a lot of perch. Um, I got a, my one buddy, Eric, he fishes for, he loves to fish for bluegill. Um, mm-hmm. that's one fish that most people don't like and don't want to fish for. Uh, he, he loves to fish for those. Um, a lot of trout through the ice. Me, I have so little experience just whatever I can get to bite. I don't, I don't really know at this point. So I just go set up, have, have a hole drilled and just try to see if I can get something on the hook. So mm-hmm. I think it was, it wasn't even last year until I caught my first fish through the ice on a fishing pole. Cause the prior year before that we used tip ups. Mm-hmm. Um, and so tip ups are with a little flag. Uh, and when you see that flag pop up, you run over and then you kind of hand line it in. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a whole different aspect and a whole different way to, to ice fish. So, but that's more of an Idaho thing than it is a Washington thing because you can fish five tip ups over in Idaho, whereas in Washington you can only fish two. So interesting. Yeah. Didn't even know that. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That is, and that's something I generally do. Like, I guess if I was to go ice worm and a hook, yeah, worm a hook. And, uh, usually when I show up to a new place, I'll 
I'll have one rod out with just bait and a bell, mm-hmm. and then I'll throw. Yep, and see what hits. Yeah, we uh, we'll winter fish Roosevelt a lot. Um, that's another great winter fishery off mm-hmm. of shore. Um, so if if it's a lot of snow or ice on the road, I don't like to pull my boat. Just not yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, so if I'm gonna go fish, then it was always shore fishing at Roosevelt, and that's why I never really got into ice fishing. Is mm-hmm. because, like I said, I just love Roosevelt so much, and I've spent so much time out there. And it was the same thing where I'd take one rod and cast it out, put a bell on it, have one bait on it, and then another rod you might cast a little jig and something back or a little spinner back to shore, um, stuff like that. And if the bait's going real good, then you'll fish both rods with bait that day, and um, you know you can choose different baits to try. And if the spinner or the jigs doing really good then you might you know just leave that bait out there obviously because you can't jig two poles at the same time unless you're really acrobatic but not me so uh and i had a buddy that went there i think it was a week or two ago and he was uh bait fishing and said he caught a bunch of fish by bait and then he tied on a jig and started casting the jig out there and said he got like three or more fish doing that so it's definitely definitely fun to be able to go catch them both ways so and i'm sure it's really rewarding for you making your own jig and then catching yeah um yeah that's part of the reason i got into uh you know even tying flies or Mm -hmm. anything like that so it started out with steelhead jigs probably almost 20 years ago uh we were fishing down in idaho for steelhead and you know we were uh younger guys at the time really didn't know what we were doing kind of learning as we went and um so we started talking to a bunch of the locals where we were fishing hanging out and trying to make friends with all the old guys that would talk to you um some of them were grumpy old dudes and wouldn't talk to you and some of them would love to share information with you right so you always try to go find the local guy that fishes there every day knows what he's doing and wants to talk to you and wants to give you information mm-hmm. and it's it's not just being a dick and going being like hey what are you using how are you doing it like go, go make friendships talk to this guy you, if, mm-hmm. if you're fishing the same spot you see him in the same spot every day and if you're there for a weekend he's there for the weekend so you start talking to him right you make build a relationship make a friendship and then eventually you start to get to know these guys after you go down there for years and whatnot so um, we started learning like all right the stuff you guys are using like you'll catch fish on them but that's not what you want to be using that's not what the locals use and that's not the guys that come down here and limit out in an hour Mm -hmm. and so we learned and so we started learning there what they're called micro jigs at the time and you just couldn't buy them in most tackle stores um, except for a couple little stores down there and it was because they were local guys that were tying them and selling them to the tackle store Mm. and so I decided well man if I want to have these jigs and be able to fish them all the time I have to start making jigs and tying jigs so we started making jigs and tying jigs um and it just kind of evolved from there and like you said just the the success of um catching the fish first off is, is awesome feeling mm-hmm. but when you do it with something that you made just is feels even better right yeah. and so it just gives you like that sense of like all right i can go out there and it sounds funny but i could survive if yeah. i needed to right um and so i just kind of gradually started building other jigs and making walleye jigs because i couldn't find walleye jigs i wanted and then, so I started making these different stuff and some guys started learning about it. And so I'd get a couple guys here or there that wanted some of my stuff and gear. So I'd make even more and I could experiment. They'd tell me different colors that they like to use. And so then I'd make stuff in their colors and I kind of adapted from there and like, all right, now I need to try this. And so it gave me different ideas. And, um, like I said, more lures, uh, uh, get more, more fishermen to bite than actual fish. Right. Mm So, um, it's all about learning what actually works too, and kind of dialing in, um, what you are making, because you don't want to just make everything under the sun that doesn't work. Um, when you know, like these certain three things work far better than anything else you'll ever make. So just get really good at those three things. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it went from, like I said, uh, the steelhead jigs to, to walleye jigs to, um, trout flies, uh, painting baits, um, just all, all different kinds of stuff that I've made now and just custom stuff. And so nowadays it's very rarely that I fish anybody else's tackle except for tackle I make. Mm -hmm. Um, just because, yeah, just because I like like the thrill of it. Obviously I'll still use some Mm -hmm. people's different tackle here and there. Um, you know, if, if, there's one bait that's or one piece of tackle that's working far superior than anything else and you're fishing with three or four guys and the one guy is catching everything on that one one tackle and if you have that or he has more you're gonna ask to use that and want to want to catch fish too right but if the tackle i make is catching fish or out fishing other you know store-bought stuff then i'm gonna fish that all day long so mm-hmm. and then uh it brings me joy now to make that stuff and have other guys fish it and be successful yeah um and send me back photos and reports oh, yeah. of stuff that i made and so it it's just kind of a good feeling to to know that that I create something that actually brings people joy and value too. So, 
Yeah, you you fish. You have a you have a triple hook of fishing when <laughs> yeah. you, when you go out. You're trying to catch fish, trying to catch content, and trying to get fishermen to buy lures. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, have you uh, done anything with the rubber, like doing rubber jigs, um, like making your own I'm, rubber? No, I've, I've never made any uh, plastic or rubber yeah. rubber baits. Um, yeah. I fished a lot for him. I started out as a, 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 you know, I was a big time bass fisherman for a lot of years before I got into all the other fishing. Obviously, everybody mm-hmm. kind of trout fishes around here. And a lot of people just look at the trout as just kind of like a give me fish. You can throw a bait out there, a worm and a hook. And, you know, if they're there, they're going to bite it. If not, then you're not catching that day. Um, so there's not really, you know, a lot of skill. Um, well, I shouldn't say that because there is. There are a lot of guys will say that there isn't. But um, being a very successful catching fish almost all the time mm-hmm. um, is a skill. Um, and, but back to that, I, I was bass fishing a lot. So I've used a lot of those baits, fished a lot of those baits. I just never really got into that because I got more into salmon still heading, um, at a certain point in my fishing career, um, where I got away from bass fishing now bass fish, maybe once or twice a year, um, where all the jigs I catch the bass on. So I jig for bass, um, are the jigs I make. So I make a lot of bass jigs too. Uh, but I just buy the plastics at this point and just use those. So. So what color jigs are they hitting I, that you make it, for the bass? Yeah, it, 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 it's random. Um, I would say for like your, your bass and your spiny ray fish and stuff like that, um, mm-hmm. your, your low lake fish, uh, a lot of natural colors are really good. Um, you're not going to use as much as like your, your bright pinks like mm-hmm. you saw me tying that fly. Um, you know, maybe some chartreuses and stuff like that here or there. But a lot of times what they'll consider like uh, – they call them pumpkin seed color or watermelon color. So it's a lot of greens, um, a lot of vegetation color, or just stuff that mimics uh, colors of nature or bugs or stuff like that. You'll see a lot of that for, for, for bass and whatnot. But when it comes to the salmonoids or the trouts and stuff like that, then you'll see a lot of these crazier baits and crazier colors um, and stuff like that. Um, even stillhead will grab, uh, we'll, we'll fish a pink worm for stillhead. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a bass worm, but it's bright pink. Uh, and a steelhead will eat that, whereas and you probably throw a green one, they might not eat that. So I, I'm not sure the science behind that, but um, it's pretty crazy so the different the different fish and what they like and choose to eat, to eat, and other ones won't. So yeah. So where do you steelhead fish around here? Uh, so we'll still have the Snake River, uh, but I like the Orfino area, Clearwater River. Um, Clearwater is one of my favorite places uh, to steelhead mm-hmm. fish. Um, it's a little bit of a drive and usually it's winter season. So hopefully the roads are nice. Um, and really depends on the run. Uh, I don't get down there as much as I like to, but some years I get down there more than others. Um, but it's probably one of the best places. And I know guys that come from all over the country to fish that world-class fishery for what they consider. So there's an A run stillhead and a B run stillhead. Um, a run stillhead typically like the biggest fish get to around eight nine pounds mm. um, whereas in the b run fish you can see up to 20 plus pounds Dang. um yeah so i'd say on average those fish are probably you know 14 15 pounds but i know some guys that have caught some 20 pound stillhead which are just giant yeah so. that's massive yeah massive yeah <laughs> so so and you're catching them off of jigs yep and so you're going to the river you're are you floating the river and like hitting different like spots behind rocks are you casting out and like jigging back uh you you can do both so there's a couple ways to do it um and so a lot of it's done by bobbers so you're bobber Mm. fishing a jig so you're floating it down river so you'll you'll just uh you know you'll cast a 45 degrees up river just let it float down you got to try to learn the river uh learn how the river flows um figure out the depths of the river uh and so the jigs are on a, a sliding um system for the bobber uh, so you can change the depth of it. Um, so you usually have your leader, which is two to four feet or however long you like your leader. Uh, mm-hmm. and then you'll have your bobber above that. And then the, uh, bobber stop is what they call it. Um, that bobber stop slides up and down your main line. And so you can put that at whatever your leader length is right at that four feet, or if mm-hmm. that hole's 20 feet deep and you need 18 feet out of it and you, then you pull it back up your line and, and cast it out. And so it just really depends on the river system you're fishing, where you're fishing, um, and how deep that is. And like I said, some of those fish, um, and most of those fish are all caught towards the bottom of the river where some of them do hover, um, in our kind of mid level of the river. Um, and like I said, really, if you want to get into river fishing, spending time on the river and learning how a river flows and what the flow of the bait and all the, the different things that come down the river is really kind of a, a science and learning mm-hmm. that. And so once you learn that and you're 
more in depth with how the river flows, the more fish you're going to catch. And so um, there definitely is a learning curve when it comes to river fishing, especially steelhead fishing. Mm -hmm. I think they call them like fish of a thousand cast or something like that. Uh, So, you know, we went many years without even catching a fish before we actually learned what we were doing. Like I said, just going down there and meeting guys and learning. Um, we, We started out totally the wrong gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and fish the wrong way for a long time until we find her like, yeah, this isn't working. We got to adapt and do something different. And so once we learned and, um, you know, then we started catching a lot more fish and we're a lot more productive. Uh, but then there's also where you can cast jigs out. Um, they call that twitching. Um, and you see it done for coho a lot, but I have seen it done for stillhead. Um, and I've seen people very successful at it, but uh, it's more of a sight fishing. Um, or if you can't see them, um, then again, it's learning those holes and where those fish are going to stack up and you'll try to cast it into them and very similar to like bass finesse fishing, uh, and just kind of twitch it back to you, um, and try not to get snagged up or bounce off the bottom or bounce off a limb overhanging in the river. Um, so there are both ways to do it. Um, just, I'd say in our part of the ecosystem, you're seeing a lot more barber guys than you are the, the twitching guys. Um, whereas in like the, the West side of the mm-hmm. state, you'll see a lot, a lot of twitching. There's a lot more coho fisheries and stuff like that over there. Um, a lot of those tributaries that are a lot easier to fish versus these fish that are, that I'm catching over here, traveling like 600 miles before mm-hmm. they get there. So, um, and again, stillhead's one of the fish, a lot of guys catch them and keep them and eat them. I don't care for them. So mm-hmm. every stillhead I catch gets released unless one of the guys I'm fishing with wants to keep it. Um, I'll usually let them keep it, but I'd probably say 90% of the fish I catch are all caught and release. Um, any salmon that we catch in the river system is usually kept because those fish mm-hmm. are going to die yeah. anyways. Yeah. Um, and so we'll smoke those up in the mm-hmm. smoker. And yep. then walleye is the only other fish, like freshwater fish that I typically like to catch and eat. Mm-hmm. Um, some trout, if I catch them out at Roosevelt, I will smoke those up and give that away to friends, stuff like that. But, mm-hmm. um, I'm a, I'm a big adversary of, you know, um, catch and release and, mm-hmm. and still having fisheries down the road for, future generations to come too. Mm-hmm. if we just um, pillage everything that we catch and keep um, whether it's planted there or not and a lot of guys don't get that concept that mm-hmm. eventually it's all going to go away right mm-hmm. and, um, especially when you learn like which fish are breeder fish in, in a river system or a lake system mm-hmm. um, like a good example I'm fishing long lake one day from shore and I catch probably an eight or nine pound walleye off the shore Dang, um, not that good. easy to do yeah not that easy to catch a walleye off that's, the shore for one but walleye. yeah so it was, a, it was a huge walleye uh, and there was a couple kids down there fishing and you know they they helped me get the fish to the shore because it pops the hook like right at the shore I had no net it's mm-hmm. probably like 40 degrees outside and so the, the kid grabs it for me I'm like, hey, will you take some photos? So we took some photos. Um, and then I go to release the fish. And he's like, hey, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so I start to have the conversation with him. I guess when I say kid, he was probably, you know, early 20s. So mm. not, not necessarily a kid. But um, nobody had ever really taken the time to explain conservation to him, mm-hmm. um, what it meant for a fish to uh, be a breeding fish in, in a system. And, and that was definitely a female that had eggs in her. Mm. Um, and so just kind of having that explanation to him like hey there's a million fish that are eater fish right like you got your 18 inch to to 12 inch walleye and that's what Mm -hmm. i consider probably an eater fish anything over 24 inches of a walleye is usually a female breeder fish there could be Mm -hmm. males too um but a lot of those female fish you want to keep in there because they're the egg layers and just because that one fish can lay, I don't know, let's, let's use a rough example, 40,000 eggs. I don't know exactly mm-hmm. what it is. Um, yeah, a lot of eggs. Those Out of all those eggs, it could be like 1% that survives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we need all those different fish. You think, well, that one, that one fish can just sustain the population when and theoretically it can't because mm-hmm. you got you got other fish eating fish you got birds eating fish you got fish that are just dying due to whatever the case may be mm-hmm. um so just having that conversation with those guys he's like you know I, I never really thought of it like that and he's like i would be more willing to release big fish and stuff like that and so i think uh, just kind of getting that mindset into a lot of the guys out there in the youth and um there's there's still going to be guys out there that are just going to kill, kill everything they keep whether they eat it or not mm-hmm. um which is just ignorance, I think, but, uh, you know, just getting that message out there and, and telling people, you know, if we, if we don't take care of what we have now, we aren't, we're not going to have it or our kids aren't going to have it or grandkids mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, no, you're right. And it, and it brings the, goes back to the point of how our sturgeon are conserved. So, you know, there's the feeder size that's like, yep. like 50 something inches. And then after that you can't keep it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Every, yeah, every, every fishery is different. Like, uh, Roosevelt where we're fishing now, um, which has only been open for about five years, hadn't been open, I think for 20, 25 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, they completely shut the fishery down. I think after they put the dam in or, or shortly after they put the dam in, um, which obviously was a great fishery for sturgeon back then. And they just kind of slowly started building the population up. Um, they actually have a sturgeon hatchery up there towards Kettle Falls somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where, um, but there's a big program with the natives where they put a bunch of fish back into that and so they know that those fish that are keeper fish now up there mm -hmm. are fish that were um, released out of the hatchery versus the bigger fish or original fish or spawned fish from that area um, mm -hmm. I've never been lucky enough to catch a keeper sturgeon I've caught a lot of sturgeon they've either been too small or too big um, and so and that's a fight yeah. Yeah. It's a fight. I, I would love to catch one to be able to eat it. Try it. I heard it's a great fish to eat actually. Um, mm -hmm. if you know how to clean them and, and take care of them, I heard it's a really good fish, but yeah, just, it's one of the fight, uh, funnest fighting fish pound for pound. I mean, I caught, uh, uh, probably as close to seven foot sturgeon. Um, and that thing, you know, it just, it just worked me. It's funny. An another really cool video I have on the page, um, is I funny story. I'm out fishing with a buddy all day. We fished all day. It's the middle of summer. It's probably 100 degrees out, hot as hell, and we had no action all day. And we're getting close to the end of the day. We're both sitting at the front of the boat on our phones, probably scrolling through Facebook or something like that, and not even paying attention. And by the time I realized it, my pole was doubled over, mm -hmm. but it, there was none, there was never like a bite or anything like that. The pole just went like heavy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I run over there and grab it. I'm like, oh, what's going on? So I start setting the hook and it's just like, man, there's nothing there. And I'm reeling. And then all of a sudden, oh wait, there's weight again, but you're not, I'm not feeling any head shake. I'm not, it's the weirdest thing ever. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I go just keep setting the hook and reeling. And finally I'm like, okay, there's a fish on, there's a fish on. So I finally get the tension to the fish. This is after a couple minutes. And then I fight this fish for a good 10, 15 minutes or so. And it had jumped out of the water, eight feet out of the oh, water. Oh damn. Yeah, huge That's fish. cool. Yeah. And, uh, there's a fighter jet that flies over while I'm fighting it. Oh, nice. I mean, this, it's a cool video. Uh, and so when I'm fighting it, I look in the water and all of a sudden I see this fishing pole swimming towards me. And I'm like, what the hell is going on right now? My buddy, he's filming and I'm like, Hey, grab the fishing pole. And so he starts to grab the fishing pole out of my hand. And I'm like, no, the fishing pole in the water. So we're both just flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on here. And so we finally grabbed the pole out of the water and my bait and hook is wrapped around that fishing pole. And so I'm trying to get my bait and hook undone while that fishing pole starting to load up. So mm -hmm. the fish was actually on this other fishing pole. Oh, gee. And so I, luckily I get my bait off of there last second um, pole almost gets ripped out of my hand. Uh, the drag was so tight that no drag could be pulled out of it. So I had to turn the drag really quick and then it just like took off and then the fish jumps again, takes me on for another run. So then I reel it up on this other fishing pole, probably for another 15 or 20 minutes. And we finally get the fish to the boat and it's about a seven foot sturgeon. Um, and so crazy fishing story, right? I get on the, uh, internet and there's a big fishing group, uh, here in Eastern Washington, Eastern Washington called Eastern Washington fishing. Um, and so I just post on there, anybody fishing up kettle the last couple days, lose a fishing pole. And so I get like 50 messages. Yeah. I lost one a year ago. I lost one six weeks ago. And I'm like, I said the last couple days guys. Mm -hmm. And so finally there's a guy up there. Um, he actually happens to be an admin of the page contacts me and he says, Hey, you know, I had a buddy that's fishing up there by himself. that had a pole ripped off the side of the boat. I said, explain the pole to me. And I could definitely tell it was an old timer pole because it mm -hmm. was w well used. Um, and so he explains the pole to me and I said, Hey, tell your buddy, I got his, I got his, uh, fishing pole. And so I explained the story to him and then I'm like, they're like, yeah, right. And I'm like, I got it all on video too. So I'll post this on YouTube, you know, in a week or so. And, uh, put the video together, talk to the old guy that lost his pole. He gives me his story. He said he had one on, um, which he probably lost his pole from, the explanation I got from him probably about 20 to 30 minutes before I caught it. Mm. So not too, not too, uh, long after he had lost it, I had hooked into it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's telling me, yeah, I have, I have a fish on one side of the a boat that I'm, that I'm fighting and I'm releasing. And he says, I look over and my other rod just getting nailed. And he said, is it broke, broke the pole holder right off the boat and took off. 
So yeah. Like a, like a bat out of hell. Yeah. And, seven yeah. foot sturgeon. Yeah, I so, would imagine. So I'm telling him this story and, uh, you know, I'm like, let's, I'll be up there in the next week or two. Let's meet up. I'll give you your pole back, mm-hmm. shake your hand, you know? So I met him, gave him his pole back, um, put the video out online and, and I'm surprised that video doesn't have a lot more, a lot more views. Um, but it's, it's a crazy one. Uh, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. It, it's, it was, do you remember what you story. titled it? Uh, I think it's, uh, something like watch me catch a seven foot fish on another on somebody else's fishing i I don't remember exactly you'd have to look it it out yeah the thumbnail is me on the boat holding the rod that looks like it's about ready to break it's just bent over like a big huge fishing rod so it's impressive that those dinosaurs live at the bottom right yeah and they of the river the columbia or wherever they say those fish get up to like a hundred years old or something like that or over a hundred years old Mm -hmm. so that seven footer is probably a 50 year old fish or something like that so it's insane and just they look crazy yeah they're just a crazy looking fish it's it, it's kind of like man luckily they don't target us right <laughs> you know yeah Maybe. so how what were you using for bait uh so that time we were using squid um i believe when i when when i hooked another when that fishing pole bit my squid so are you just bottom fishing are you just throwing squid yep are you looking for something on the fish binder? Where you, what are you looking for for like terrain? Uh, yeah. So I'm not I'm not that adverse of a of a uh, of a um, sturgeon fisherman. So mm-hmm. I'm still kind of learning. I've only done it for a few years, but I I found this channel. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was the main river channel that was uh, there was a flat above it. Um, and so if I could get right on this flat perfectly and cast right to the edge of that channel. Um, I, for some reason I just feel fish were working that ledge right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I've always done really well in that spot and that's where we were fishing in that particular time. Um, but there's a lot of guys and what I've learned is, uh, if you got a really good fish finder is try to go find fish mm-hmm. and then fish on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll see they're, they're huge, right? So you see mm-hmm. big marks down there. Um, and with sturgeon, I've been told, you know, if you cast out and you don't get a bite within like 45 minutes to move, um, even if there's fish there, again, those aren't the, the eating fish. So go find the eating fish. Um, and so I've caught, like I said, I've caught my fair share of sturgeon, but it's something I'm still kind of learning how to, how to do. And, um, but again, I've caught them on, uh, squid, kokanee, um, herring. Uh, what else have we caught them on? Haven't caught one on a hot dog yet. I've tried it. Uh, Frank's red hot. Mm. Frank's red hot was a secret sauce one day. Uh, every, oh, really? every, yeah. Salmon bellies. Uh, every, yeah, salmon bellies. Yeah. Every, Every lure or every bait we threw out there, we doused it in Frank's Red Hot sauce, cast it out, and it was like fish on, fish on, fish on. Um, that's only happened one time, though. I've used Frank's Red Hot a ton of other times and never caught fish on it. So I saw that on another YouTube video to use Frank's Red Hot. But I think it's uh, a lot of the sturgeon baits are um, pickled in vinegar. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's the vinegar probably in the hot sauce or something like that. Something to do with the vinegar attracts the fish and brings them to the bait. So, Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. I want to do that. I want to go. I've never caught a sturgeon. Yeah, they're but, uh, they're fun. I, I mean, I always go out salmon fishing and like, well, I could try to catch a sturgeon. Right. And so, so you're looking for channelization points underwater where is it like a deeper point? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anything that's going to change the structure. Um, mm-hmm. I fish are correlated to structure a lot I, from, mm-hmm. from what I found all fish are, whether that structure is a log down there, um, a boulder, um, a weed bed. Um, and every fish is going to like structure a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I, I learned that a lot with walleye fishing, especially fishing those, those ledges and them channels. Um, so in the fish finders, they have map cards. Um, some of the map cards actually have, uh, like a, it's kind of like a topu map. Um, so, so you can see like the grade gradation of the different levels of the water. You got and a nice the, one. Yeah. I mean, it's an older one, but there's a lot nicer ones, yeah. but I, so I got that map card, um, and, and going from just the same fish finder to adding the map card into it, mm-hmm. um, just really changed the, my ability as a fisherman, I think, mm-hmm. um, just knowing that the different, being able to find that structure a lot easier and being able to read that graph and, and know where the river changes or the lake changes um, and see different stuff down there and know, know that fish correlate with that um, just brought my catch rate up tremendously, I think, and just made me a better fisherman understanding that. And I think that's some guys 
um, that don't have that, uh, but still are very good fishermen and they get that, it's going to make them even more advanced, I would think. So that's something I, I highly recommend to everybody. If they got a decent fish finder on their boat, um, to get that map card, make sure that they're seeing all those, those different levels in the water and all that. So, Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Getting the map card. So where, where do you, where do you see your channel going? Where do you want to take your, um, you know, I, I haven't made as many videos as I wanted to last year. I had a goal to make a lot more videos and I didn't get to. So I, mm-hmm. I would definitely like to put out more content, um, being able to get out there. It's tough though. Right. So you go out fishing and like you said, you gave me some good ideas just because I'm not catching fish. I can still give out information and provide value. Mm-hmm. Um, I always thought, you know, I, I go out there, I turn on the cameras and if I don't catch fish, then it's just film ran and wasted because, uh, you know, there was nothing there, but I could have utilized that better um, and, and still provided value and, and provided tips and not what not to do, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just I looked at it like uh, if I don't catch fish, it, it doesn't make for a good video or that's not always the case. I just need to be uh, more intuitive in the way that I present it, I think. So that's one thing I would like to do is to provide more value um, and then be able to show uh, just different techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, I fished with some guides and, and just uh you know, um, having them open up a little bit more. I, I do a, a fishing video um, usually once a year with uh, Phil from Fishhead Outdoors. There's a couple on the page right now where he's, he's a master at Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. Um, they're all winter trout fishery that, that we've done videos on. Um, but just even fishing with him, like, it's more of just uh, showing what happens instead of, like, explaining more stuff. So I think yeah. explaining more um, and just giving more value in that sense will help build my subscriber base. Um, and just be, be more of an asset to people out there versus just watching somebody reeling a fish. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I feel you cause I've made a, every time, well, since I decided to start filming everything, <laughs> uh, I, I, and my dad called me out on that. It's like, yeah, well maybe next time we go salmon fishing, we talk about what we use mm-hmm. instead of just going straight to the fishing. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I should do that. I need to do that. I need to make a better production, script it more. And, and I, and I find that'll help. Uh, hunting is a little bit easier because it's like, well, if you, if you're lucky, but, uh, but yeah, that, that is something to consider. So, so having more tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. I think and like I've, I've started to do that. Like, uh, just my last video on mm-hmm. there was like, cause I make all these flies and then, um, I realized there's guys that have purchased them from me that never even fished a fly and don't even know what they're doing with them. So I'm mm-hmm. like, Oh, well let me put a video together on how to fish these flies. It's very simple. And I don't give a ton of information on it, but I give just enough to be dangerous. Right. Um, and get, get you intrigued. And so I think just kind of, um, stepping, taking that to the next level, um, mm-hmm. giving a little bit more info. And I think a lot of guys, and especially, you know, from fishing, uh, there's a lot of guys that are very secretive, right. And don't want to share stuff. And there's certain stuff I'm not going to give out, you mm-hmm. know, I'm not going to give everything. I'm going to yeah. give you probably 99% of it. And it's pretty cool too, because nowadays, uh, you know, I've been out on the dock or launching the boat at, uh, you know, Roosevelt or another lake or something like that. And some guy comes up to me and starts talking to me, um, and addressing me like he, like he's talked to me and known me before mm-hmm. or, or knows me. Um, and, you know, I'm, I don't hold back and I like to give and help. And so I do. Um, and one time, uh, I'm talking to this guy and I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, have we met before? And he's like, no, I just watch your, watch all your videos. And, and he's like, so I feel like I know you. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And so that was, it was very, uh, you know, uh, reassuring to me like, oh, what I'm doing is, is working and and it's, and it's helping people. Yeah. You got a good channel. Yeah. Good metrics. It it was cool to to be able to do that. And it's like, uh, so I I called it fishing famous, which is, Mm -hmm. is silly and all that, but, um, just meeting other people too. And, and people that watch the page and, and getting to interact with them in real life is, is very cool too. So, um, you know, we do all this stuff in front of the screen all the time and half the time it's like, is, Am I, am I even talking to anybody out there? <laughs> but you really are. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and so you, you just got to remember that and, and keep giving, I think. So, yeah, that's important. Hey, do you remember it was last year? It was these dudes who were got caught cheating in a walleye tournament. I did see that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That made me think. Yeah, of they that. got they got legal consequences, like yeah. their boats taken because I think they had won a boat or something like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was a big deal. There's a lot of memes and stuff on the mm-hmm. internet, a lot of jokes about that. Um, and and I fished uh, 
I fished other little derbies and tournaments and stuff before too, where similar things have happened. Um, I know there's the Brewster salmon derby we fish and I believe something similar happened, but maybe not. Um, uh, but I know they won the fish, like every fish gets wanded to make sure that mm-hmm. there's no medals and stuff like that. Uh, That's we were fishing smart. a little local, um, bass derby. This was just like, uh, one of my buddies worked at this place. And so all the guys, there was like 50 guys that got together and they invited some of their friends. And so it kind of grew over the years and, mm-hmm. um, it was just a big fish. Uh, derby and it was always held at all these different lakes i won it twice um, out of the three or four years i fished it um but one of the years uh, a couple of the kids um left a lure down in its throat and like tried mm. to get away with it to add a couple you know a couple extra ounces mm-hmm. or whatever and it's like what are you guys doing like come on this is just for fun like camaraderie type thing and then mm-hmm. you're pulling this shit for you know a couple hundred dollar prize i get those guys were on a whole different level right but mm-hmm. yeah it was crazy how, how they did that and thought they i mean you think they got away with it before yeah you well it, what's nuts is they would have won yeah even without it yeah even yeah. without it right so they didn't need to do any of that yeah. well it just goes it, well what's crazy is these fishing derbies like well do you um there's some major prizes for some of these oh, yeah. ones. Like they give away boats. Yeah. Like yeah. 10 grand. Yeah. Those guys probably have that $80,000 boat. Those guys got taken from them that I think they had won at a previous tournament or something like that the year mm-hmm. before. So yeah, it's pretty insane. Like the bass master is so big now and the money's so big in it. Like I've heard of stories of, uh, you know, guys going out and catching bass like before and tying them up to docks and stuff oh. like that and going, cause they, they're live, uh, yeah. weigh in so that the bass has to be alive or you get mm-hmm. penalized. Um, and so just like, just the thought of that, like, is just crazy to me. And like your whole, why, why even do it? Your reputation, like they, those guys can never fish again. I mean, mm-hmm. they can fish for, if they consider it fun at that point, but their, their career was ruined. And I mean, they can't even get a real job and you know, like a regular job anymore because nobody wants to hire that guy for being so unethical. Right. So mm-hmm. I think, uh, being an outdoorsman and, and, and a sportsman like that too, ethics comes into play a lot for me personally. Like I mm-hmm. want to be ethical. And like I said, that kind of goes back to conservation stuff like that too. And just having good moral ground, I think as a per- person in general, um, where obviously there's shitty people out there, right. And mm-hmm. do shitty things. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do you plan on doing any tournaments this year? Um, I might fish the Brewster Derby. I've done that quite a bit uh, in the past. Um, I've never, never won, never placed on the leaderboard, but uh, mm. it's it's a, it's fun. It's a it's a big event that goes on. Um, so if I get the chance and I'm free, um, it just usually that's, uh, I think the first week in August, if I do that, I'll do that. There's a ice fishing derby coming up on Sashine Lake. Um, I think that's mid February, February 12th or something like that. Um, so I'm going to do that this year. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a small one, just like a 15 or $20 buy-in. Um, whereas I think like the Brewster Derby is like $150 buy-in or something like that. So they're all, they all vary. Um, obviously the more you pay, the more prizes, uh, more you can win. Um, but the ice fishing derby is going to be fun because, uh, you know, I, I don't expect to win, but, um, if I do cool. And if not, I'm going to try to make some content, bring the videos out there and try to get some uh, action and see if we can put together a video for that too. Yeah. And I was thinking, how would that go down? Like I'm going to be ice fishing on Satchin Lake for a fishing derby. And today I'm going to be using this, this, and this, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Or and not to like do it. <laughs> switch to like the the image of the jigs like bloop, 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 right just quick editing and then or whatever or if you catch something big just start I got this big fish in <laughs> ice fishing derby you know and then that, I pull it out it's a two inch perch yeah, two inch <laughs> perch or something but that's fu- well the thing is those fishing shows are educational and they're they're hypnotic. Yeah. You know, you, it's it's kind of like ASMR. It, I don't know. If you ever remember Bill Dance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bill Dance. So do you have with and that was part of the fun of Bill. He was really good at fishing. Though. Yeah. He was freaking really good. But he was still had all those follies and issues. Yeah, his like, bloopers are the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sticking his poles up into the fans and the boat launch fails. Do you have any good boat launch fail stories? Uh, me, I would never share if I did. Oh, or <laughs> no, ones you've seen. I've seen some crazy <laughs> stuff at the boat launch. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I want to. I want to try to get more blooper stuff. That would be that'd be real fun. Um, I do have occasionally. I'll catch some of my friends doing st- some stuff and get it on blooper. Um, I, I can't think of anything like super crazy off the top of my head that I've yeah. seen a, at the boat launch. But the boat launch. I mean, if you do want a good show, like take your lawn chair, set it up at the boat launch, like that first week of fishing season, and just go watch people launch their boats. I mean, it's it's hysterical. Um, actually, I, I can think of one decent story. So uh, I was fishing at um long lake nine mm-hmm. mile uh and the boat launch gets crazy i mean it's like you're waiting in line there's no parking uh there's a parking lot up the road that sometimes you have to go park at which is a good you know five minute walk back down to the launch um so i'm waiting my turn i gotta launch my boat and there's a boat at the dock and they're just not moving and so like i'm backed up to the water about ready to put my boat in and I can see panic, like, and everybody's eyes are panicking. And so like, I get out of my truck, I run over there. I'm like, what's going on? And the guy's like, Oh, we didn't put our plug in the boat. Oh shit. (laughs) And so the boat's sinking, right? Like right in front of us. And so he's like trying to bell water. Everybody's trying to bell water. And his dad had to go, go around. And so like, it's not only is it a five minute walk, but you have to drive around the area, like out back onto the main road. So it's like a good five minute drive. So the dude's at least 10 minutes away. He had just left. And so the, this guy is freaking out. And so his dad finally starts coming back down and like the guy's so hysterical. I'm like, get your boat out of the way. Let me launch my boat. We'll get my boat around and then we'll put your boat on my trailer to get the water out. And like, he's, he's hysterical, not listening to me at all. And so he sees his dad and he's just yelling, dad, dad. And so the dad comes running over and so I have to talk to the dad, like have the same conversation, mm-hmm. like, listen, this is what we need to do. You're not going to make it back up to the truck in time and back down. And there's already a line for you to get. You can't get past everybody. And so I finally convince him we get my boat in the water, uh, get their boat on my trailer, get all the water out of it and actually, you know, get them on their way. Smart um, move. Yeah. So luckily I was there and I was willing that a lot of guys are assholes and wouldn't be willing to even do that and just be like, get out of my way and like not try to help. But obviously you know, I want to make sure that everybody's safe, get them taken care of. And so luckily we, we got him, got him back on the water and, and crisis averted. Um, and so that, that was pretty crazy. And I guess that leads me to, I will tell the, I will tell a story about myself and the boat launch. Um, so, uh, one of my first boats, 12, that 12 foot John boat that I lost down, man, I had some times with that boat, that 12 mm-hmm. foot John boat. I lost down the, the Lake Roosevelt. I'm out at Liberty Lake bass fishing. Uh, and I go to launch my boat, same situation where, where Liberty Lake has very little parking. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to pull up, um, go way back up onto the road, park down in the neighborhood and walk back down. And it can be a 10 minute walk by the time you get back to the boat. So I'm there by myself. It's a uh, weekday. It's not too busy. Uh, I tie the boat up, launch the boat, tie the boat up to the dock, drive away, go up to the car, start to walk back down. I see this other guy launching his boat and i'm like how's he launching his boat with my boat tied to the dock right there and so then i turn the corner and i look and my boat's not on the dock anymore and i'm like what's going on and i see my tackle bag floating and my lunch pail floating and i look in the water and there's my boat sunk on the boat launch oh damn sunk all the way down because i forgot to put the plug in by the time i made it back to it the boat was already on the boat launch so then this guy's trying to back down and i'm like stop stop and he's like what i'm like my boat sunk right here and so then I'm yanking the boat out by hand, dragging it up the launch, luckily get it out just enough to get a bunch of the water out, finally get it floating again and get on my way. But that guy was an ass. He tried mm-hmm. to, like, he started yelling at me for my boat being sunk there. And, um, you know, I'm already, I was probably 20 at the time. Mm-hmm. So it's one of my first boats, very inexperienced. Um, you know, already like nervous as all hell and, and embarrassed and like just trying to, trying to get my boat, save my boat. And, mm-hmm. and, and so I, it was a very hectic moment and I definitely make sure I check the plug now every time and then try not to do that one again. So, Hey, you know what? I don't think a lot of people have learned. I don't think my dad's learned that lesson <laughs> after all these years Yeah, that there's this guy in the Marines. His name was Neil. I don't know if he's still in. I hope not. But either way, this guy, it was a saga. But there's these uh, vehicles. They're called um, LAR or LAVs, so light armored vehicles. And they can go on land and go into the water. And he forgot to put the damn plug in it. And these plugs are big. Like they're like one foot 
diameter so it's plugs. taking a lot of water quick yeah and so as soon as the vehicle went in to because they launch them at a specific boat launch in the harbor there it just instantly sank but everybody got out it was fine because the harbor's not that deep but they had to tow it out and he got in a lot of trouble i bet yeah yeah it's not <laughs> not fun watching your boat sink uh yeah, so I made a checklist yeah, after that, and so good I, for yeah, you. Started checklist, down, yeah. Yes. Started going down the, the checklist. Military does. He didn't yep. go by the checklist <laughs> because the plug's part of it. Yeah, and it's I'm I'm a firm believer of once you do something so much and you do it right, then it becomes natural, right? It's habit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so eventually, I got to the point where after the checklist, I didn't need it any longer, but I still make sure that I follow that. And even with my new boat, um, I would do something stupid. I'm like, all right, you're back to the checklist. Like as soon as you mess up one time, you're back to that checklist. That's and, a lot of discipline. Yeah. You have a lot of self-discipline. <laughs> Good for you. And it's also something with being the boat owner, like in taking people like, and I get it, people want to help. And so they'll, they'll try to do certain stuff on the boat. And I say, no, I want to do it all. That way I make sure it's done the same exact way every time. And mm-hmm. so it helps me remember and make sure I'm keeping that routine and not forgetting stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you, do you got a billage pump? Yeah. Uh, yep. Got, got the bilge pump. Um, some funny stories with those. Uh, we, we, we were on a boat one time and, uh, the weather came in and the waves were crashing. And the next thing we know we're in a jet boat and the jet boat's like six inches of standing water. And it's like how much water can be standing before we start to sink. And so we tried to run the bilge pump and the bilge pump just sprayed right back into the boat. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> there was a hole in the hole in the line. And oh. so it was just spraying right back into the boat. Um, I had another boat in between the boat that I have now and my, my little 12 footer, uh, that, um, was a riveted boat. And so riveted boats just leak. Um, mm-hmm. so that one, like after being out two hours, you had to run the bilge pump. Otherwise you're full of water. So it's like just running the bilge pump all the, all day. So I put that one on a float. So when it got to a certain level, it would just turn on automatically and just make sure that bilge pump worked before you get out on the water though. So, yeah, yeah. That's all, or, or else you're bailing by bailing, hand yeah. for whatever taking, reason, taking the piss jug and trying to get the yeah, water out, taking the piss jug and getting it out. Yeah. So do you have any, um, uh, big trips planned for this year? Like what? Uh, no, like I said, I'll try to try to do Brewster. Um, I mean, that's not a big trip. It's something I do quite often. At least I try to do that at least once a year. It used to be where when I was younger, I'd fish that thing all like every weekend. Uh, but now I don't get out as much. So I try to do that. I try to fish down in White Bluffs at least once or twice a year. Um, we used to do Vernita fish camp down in the fall. Mm. That was always fun where you just mm-hmm. go down there, throw up some tents, um, or bring a trailer down or whatever you got, uh, camp for four, four days or so, and then just fish. So that, that's always pretty mm-hmm. fun. Um, and then just want to do a bunch of camping trips out at Roosevelt this, this spring and stuff like that. Uh, and if I can find any <clears throat> fishing derbies or tournaments to fish that I haven't fished before, maybe do some of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, no real trips planned outside of Washington or Idaho at this point. So hopefully, hopefully get some something planned in the next year or two that that's a pr- little bit more exotic. So that'd be fun. Yeah, I try to do one coast trip a year. Yeah, I don't. I I I, I should try to fish more on the coast. Um, just even doing some of those coastal rivers over there. I haven't done a lot of that, so that'd be fun. Like I said some of the coho or, or something like that, or just even, even fishing off the, uh, beaches over there by Seattle and stuff. I know there's a lot of guys that catch salmon and stuff like that, doing that too. That'd be fun. Something I've never done. So I think that'd be good for the channel too, getting out there and doing some stuff that's not so normal to me. And, um, just kind of giving me a little bit more pressure to try to adapt to the situation. Right. Yeah. I think it would be cool to go. You could do, you could make a great video if you went during the summer and you went to Long Beach, and because Long Beach is the longest beach in North America, yeah, people don't know that it's twenty, it's like almost a marathon, twenty six miles from one point to the other. So you can go on Long Beach with the little boon, dune buggies and drive and camp, and oh, okay. you can light fires with beech wood, and you can just sit and fish for surf perch all day, yeah, on, and these surf perch are big that they have at long that here in the pacific northwest uh-huh. we have big fat surf perch yeah that'd be fun i've never done that yeah and you can and they they're really aggressive they'll hit a lot of things you can make your own jigs and throw them out yeah i, I believe it was long beach this year where one of my buddies went and i think he pink fished pink salmon fished for her. 
uh, right off Long Beach there, just like, cause that's right by Seattle, right? Like, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right in the city there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's where he fished and he said he went out there in like 30 minutes and they caught a lemon of salmon. So yeah, it's a cool place. Uh, it, it just something to leave your comfort zone, get some new footage. Even if you don't get anything, at least, you know, you left your comfort zone and yeah. saw, you know, went on the beach. That's what I'm all about. I want to do my, uh, my spear fishing trip at uh well last year last year i did tuna this year i did lingcod but i want to get out and start spear fishing the jetty yeah that's a lot of fun what's the what's the water temperature doing that well you definitely need a seven mil wetsuit okay that has a hood um but and during the summertime it's it's not that bad. Yeah. And you can always get crab. Okay. So you can always limit on crab real quick, free diving for them. So every time I go and I visit my kids in Oregon, mm-hmm. I will free dive for the crab. Okay. It's cool because I, I limit in like two hours, like less than two hours. And depending on how many crab I, I find, and it's so easy to grab them, the, the, the crab are dumb. Like just, <laughs> you go down on one breath and I'm not going down deep. Right. Literally. I am in five feet of water to where I can see. And, and, uh, I just go down. If I see when I dive down and I can tell now whether or not it's legal size mm-hmm. and I grab it, flip it over, sex it. If it's a male, I'll go to the top and they don't fight you until they're out of the water. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, as soon as you grab them, their claws go outboard, and they don't fight. But as soon as you go to the surface, then they're going to try to bite at you, uh, yeah. try to pinch your uh, hands, so then you got to throw them in the bag. Right. Um, the lobster, though, the lobster are a different. They're a different thing. So when I first started going for a lot, they only come out at night. So you can only free dive for lobster at night. You can... You can spear fish and do crabbing during the day, which is fine. Crab are easy. Uh, but the lobster, they only come out at night, and they look like massive cockroaches. These things are big. And the spiny lobsters are what they're called. So they don't have the claws? No, no right. claws here. Yep. So they're, the main lobster or the specific lot, those are the only ones with okay, the that's claws. What I thought, yeah. So everywhere else from uh, San Francisco is where the spinies start. All the way down to Mexico, and then they and then spinies are in the uh, Gulf, all the way up to the Atlantic, and then they kind of stop where the main lobster are. Okay. So it's we actually have a lot of lobster. We have a massive lobster no, population. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, a lot of people don't, and and I didn't realize because when when people first told me about the lobster in California, I thought, oh, they're little lobster, just little bait. No, no, these are freaking big. Yeah, big bugs. And my neighbor is the one who got me turned on to him. His name was Lou, and because Lou would tell me about how he'd go out and free dive for him and get them in five to 15 feet of water and limit within an hour. And so I, and so I got all, so I'm a scuba diver. So I have all my, my equipment Mm -hmm. and I just went out to go free dive for him. And Lou told me, don't wear gloves. You need your dexterity. And then I go out and I grab the lobsters in real quick. After the first couple, I put on gloves because they cut the shit out of me. (laughs) Because as soon as you pull the lobster out of the water, they don't fight you. And so I found this way. So when, when I'm when I'm hovering over, if I see a lobster, I go down, I grab him, I push him down into the bottom. Mm-hmm. And if he's a big one, I'll bring him to my chest and gator roll, like a gator, literally. And that disorients him enough. And then so I can pull him up to the surface and put him in my game bag. But okay. if you don't gator roll him... And you get them to the surface, their tails just, quack, 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 oh. and they got spines, literally spines underneath there on their tails. Uh huh. And they look like rosebush thorns and they are just as sharp. But anyway, I told Lou, I'm like, Lou, what the hell, man? Like my hands are all cut up. <laughs> and he said, now you have a respect for the lobster. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, Lou. Thanks, Lou. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, he's a good guy. You, you need to go down to uh, the Keys for mini lobster season in July. Have you heard of that? 
No. Yeah, so I think they're the same same type of lobster. Well, yeah, they got the well, they got the spinies. And what's cool about down in Florida is the spinies are uh, they're a little bit smaller than the ones. Yep. Then yeah, they're not that big. Yeah, the cold water makes them bigger here in the Pacific. Gotcha. But you can use tickle sticks, which you can't do in California. So California, it's hand only. And if they're stuck in a crevice, you can't try to get them out with a stick. Right. So down in Florida, you can use tickle sticks. Yep. Yeah, there's a, where we stayed, one of the places down in the Keys, uh, there was a kid uh, just swimming around off the little pier there and he was just swimming down and grabbing them and pulling them out but it was season wasn't open mm-hmm. so you couldn't keep any of them but um i put the gopro down in there and, and it's on the florida video where you just see just tons of them down there in the little rocks and stuff like that and i think it's only open for like two or three days out of the year uh but i guess it's just like that's like the most populated time there is down in the keys like it's mm-hmm. impossible to get a place if you don't reserve it a year ahead of time and no boat slips available, stuff like that. I heard it's just boom town down there, but very, very cool. Would be fun to do. So, I want to move there one day. Man, it's so to awesome Florida, <laughs> just because I've lived. You know, I, I don't plan on living here my whole life. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I have a goal to have a place down in Florida at some point. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, that would be. Uh, so, have you done any traveling outside the U.S.? Uh, just, just Mexico. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Mexico, Canada, not, mm-hmm. not outside of North America yeah, though. So neighboring yeah. countries. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what do you do besides fishing? What do you do for fun? For fun? For hobbies and fun. Uh, mainly fishing for hobbies, yeah. uh, fishing or, or making lures, stuff like that. Otherwise just spend time with the family. Uh, I, I also make art. Um, so, uh, I haven't made art in a couple of years, but there's, like I said, I get, I have a creative side. So there's times where I just get balls to the walls and I make a bunch of art. Um, I do a bunch of, uh, like I used to do a bunch of stencil work, a bunch of, uh, graffiti style work mm. and then spray paint work, acrylic work. Um, so I, uh, have a little page on, uh, Instagram for that. But like I said, I just haven't been that active on that one, but, um, I definitely think I've been thinking about it and kind of incorporating the, the outdoors and fishing and stuff into art too, maybe making some fish art and stuff like that. So, um, but other than that, yeah, just pretty simple to spend time with family, hang out and try to get outdoors as much as possible. So do you have a, uh, website for your lures? I don't. So everything is just, uh, through Facebook or, mm. or Instagram. So if anybody tries to find me and I actually get <clears throat> messages, like somebody sees me on YouTube and then looks me up and sees the only thing they can find for me is, uh, Facebook or, or, or uh, or Instagram. And so that's how they, they just message me, message me right through there. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't sell a lot of lures. Most mm-hmm. of the lures are for friends, family, yeah. myself. Um, it's more of a hobby thing. So it's mm-hmm. not an official business or anything that I do. Um, so it's just being a hobby. I, like I said, I tie when I want to, I don't have to be so worried about, um, place people placing orders and having to get their orders done, stuff like that. I, I, I originally started, uh, pack tack was going to be specific tackle is how it started. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was going to be a tackle store, sell tackle and try to sell tackle to other stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I started and got some orders and like took me away from just like my everyday life and my hobbies and being able to go fish. And so it was where it was fun to be a hobby. It was no longer fun to be a job. Um, so mm-hmm. I decided I don't want to make tackle as like a profession or as an actual job. Um, I have another job and I use that as my outlet to unwind. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like I said, a lot of times I give, give a lot of flies away. Um, or when guys do order flies and I have small orders, stuff like that, I'll sell them to a select few guys. But other than that, um, yeah, it's just more of a hobby than anything. So what have you thought about next for tackle making? Uh, you know, these flies, these, I see these flies being a big part of it for, for a while. Um, I, I have wanted to try to design something that's more of a, something I could maybe patent and then make, make that where I could possibly mm. sell it. Um, but I just, I just have tried to been thinking of different things. And um, that's nice where you can do prototypes with 3D printers and stuff like that mm-hmm. now. So um, I really haven't found anything that I like that I think would be marketable or put out. Um, something sim- similar to like, uh, the Brad super baits, how those got so big and how they're patented and like, you can't really find anything like that. And so if they didn't, if they're not putting them out then you're stuck with what's out there. Um, yeah. so I don't know, just, it would be cool to have something and be able to get to a point where I did have an actual fishing lure. That wasn't something that 
was so much handmade. Not that I obviously don't like the handmade. The handmade mm-hmm. quality is awesome for my hobby. But like if I did want to go more business pursuit, I think it would have to be something where I can't make all the lures myself and then be, you know, major profitable in it. So hmm. I didn't even think about the concept of 3D printing the plugs. Yeah, <clears throat> I think the, I think that might be how I've seen some what guys call the prototypes of those super mm-hmm. baits. And it was like some 3D printed stuff. That's kind of how I got on, online with that. And um, there's another guy. uh this goes, goes by Ray Spinners, um, which I have some videos. I fish with his stuff, which is just a 3D printed blade. Um, mm-hmm. Looks just like a little X kind of and uh, wing blade thing that you put in front of your beads and hooks, and that's the lure. And so he, he made those, sent some to me, and uh, I put them on and was very successful with them, something that he just 3D prints and sells. And um, so it was pretty cool and kind of gave me the idea, like, I need to make something that's, you know, mine too. And so... Um, just trying to figure out what that is. And uh, I've tried some stuff and just hasn't been anything that I thought would be successful or, or be able to catch those fishermen and, and be a good product for the market. So, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that spinners, like if you were to make your own metal spinner. Yeah. That'd be tough though. Cause you, that'd take like engineering and like bending and tedious work. Yeah. Yeah. And it has to, depending on what it is like you can make a dodger you could come up with a dodger or something mm-hmm. like that i think would be productive but then you gotta you know source the metal and have somebody stamp it and all that stuff and so like what's the cost of that versus what you can sell it for and then still have to probably do some once you have it stamped from a manufacturer you still maybe have to paint it or add flash or stickers or whatever the case may be to it and that's kind of the hard part i think uh and just anything, right? Like anybody that makes a product that doesn't cost that much is being able to make it affordable for one, the consumer, but still being able to make it at a price point where you're able to make money and it be worth your time and effort and all that. And so I, I don't know. I think that's why we see a lot of cheap stuff sold these days, but yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. So you got a good, so you're building your brand pack. eye around your your uh, ability to make mostly the flies at this point yeah flies or jigs or custom flies stuff jigs. yeah um and it's just it's just mostly been about the 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 youtube channel um has just been about giving you know value but mm-hmm. the 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 pack tack on like the instagram facebook and like that that brand that i've made there um i've tried to mesh the the youtube into that more now um and showing like I want to get more into like some DIY stuff. Like um, before I didn't, wouldn't like do videos of my flies and stuff like that, because Mm -hmm. obviously if you pay attention, like, and you bought them or had them, um, you'd be able to kind of replicate them. But then I'm like, I'm just, I figured it this way. Like I'm not really selling a bunch of them. I'm not looking to make a bunch of money off selling the flies. Um, So why not use that as another avenue to try to drive, drive traffic to my YouTube Mm -hmm. is being able to show like, this is how you do make the flies, or this is how you can make tackle, or this is how you can paint baits, or this is how you can make jigs or different things. And then now that I made the fly, let's go fish with the fly. And this is how you use the fly. And this is different ways that you can catch fish on the fly. Or these are different fish that you can catch on the fly. Um, because there's always going to be the DIY guy. Mm-hmm. And then there's always going to be the guy that wants to buy the fly. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the DIY guy, I want to help him out and show him, Hey, this is how you do it. And then the guy that wants to buy the fly, maybe he can get a hold of me. And if I have some available, I'll sell them to him at the time. I don't per se take orders. Um, really so much as like, uh, I tied up like 75 or a hundred or something like that. And then I posted like, this is what I have available right now. If you want to buy them, buy them. Um, when they're gone, they're gone type deal. Um, that's kind of like how I work it. Like as a, like I said, still being like just my hobby and selling some here or there. Um, but a lot of them still just get given away or I just put them in my tackle box and I'll tie one up just to see if it, that color works, try different color combos, different, different stuff like that. And, uh, just kind of go from there. So. The DIY marketing is really powerful. I didn't realize how powerful it was until you need, it's like, uh, so I need to put a trailer plug in. I need to install a new trailer mm-hmm. plug in from my forerunner. So I Google how to install trailer lights for a forerunner, right? And the guy who has the video, he's showing this specific type of trailer plug in that he got at AutoZone or wherever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I need 
that specific <laughs> one because that is the only video I have right. that, that I know of to make it work. Yeah. And he showed me how to do it, you know. And so that is huge. Like how to how to fish for uh, kokanee in Coeur d'Alene 2024. That's right. how I'd title it. Yeah. And then, hey, I'm here to fish for co- Hey, everybody, see this kokanee? It's awesome. I caught this kokanee on this and this and this. And today we're going to go over how how I did it. So, yeah. we'll start off the day. We first, and then uh, you could also uh, do just regular narration too. So, uh, the after the thing, you could be the narrator. Yeah, we first took off in the morning around five o'clock. We yeah. put it in the boat and took <clears throat> off to the, to the spot right here. Right here, we got uh, my buddy Bill. Bill is doing all the stuff and so like you're the cameraman narrator yeah no yeah i, I look yeah i want to do more voiceover type mm-hmm. stuff and things like that yeah but i think yeah like you said the diy is just huge and especially mm-hmm. with youtube right it's the mm-hmm. largest search engine out there and that's because it's mostly diyers looking on how to do stuff or how to improve or uh you know even if it's just looking for fishing videos really what they're mm-hmm. doing is they're trying to learn right so um i think yeah just being able to bring that to to the viewer um and helping them and then you know being able to again just i can't say it enough bringing more value to people and that's gonna i think help build build the channel and the brand and get me to probably where i want to be with mm-hmm. with what i'm doing with it so i and, and i don't even know what that is at this point but um obviously the more subscriptions and more views and stuff like that. It just makes me want to put out more content. So yeah, it's fun yeah. and it's a great thing to do and it's meaningful. And I remember when I first got into uh, fishing, living in California, I went to YouTube. How do I fish in San Diego County from the jetties? Yeah. And this guy was there. He's like, Hey, but just some random dude. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm using these white jigs and, cast them out oh got one oh got one oh. yeah and I'm like okay i need those jigs i'm gonna get those specific and i bought them yeah. <laughs> i still have them i couldn't catch a damn <laughs> but <laughs> they caught the fisherman yeah, yeah they caught the fisherman yeah you got it you nailed it yeah so um yeah we've been going over two hours now two hours 15 minutes um any anything else you want to cover i mean no i anything think anything on your heart I think I think we covered a lot, so I hope hopefully somebody g- gained something out of listening to this. So I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you're a great conversational. This is a great podcast. Thanks. This is a good one. This is one my, first my dad one. would listen to. <laughs> it was one. Yeah, that's why it's a. It's great fishing. It, it, yeah, it, it's very relatable, and that's the thing. You've got a great channel, and people relate to fishing, and people that's something people want to binge. There's a massive market for it, and it's great, relaxing, and it's empowering to know that you can create your own lures and catch your own fish with it, and then give that meaningful experience to other fishermen so they can be successful too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, where can people find you? Uh, so of course, pack tack fishing on YouTube. Um, always want to try to get more, uh, likes and subs on there. That's like mm-hmm. you said, I'm, I'm fishing for those likes and subs on YouTube. Yeah. Um, that's why I put out the content. Uh, they can find me on also Facebook, um, pack tack fishing on Facebook, pack tack fish fishing on Instagram. Um, and then pack tack fishing on TikTok. So one of those social media outlets, and then you'll be able to see some of the lures I put together, um, some of the fishing journeys I go on. And then uh, obviously a lot of the videos that I put out. So Cool. Well, you guys heard it. We'll have all those links in the video description below. Be sure to like, subscribe, check out Jeremy's channels, like, subscribe, smash that bell for more data-driven updates, and bye!